Let's see if it even works. Let's see if it works. You're live. All right. We're back home. All right. Let's see how this connection goes. We'll see. We'll see. See, Randy already got me the screen capture. See? See, you pushed to your city. Hmm. That's cool. pretty cool. That's pretty neat. Well, we're back home. Let's see if anybody else is on. I hope this is more. Let me know if this is actually streaming better because we just switched to internet connections here. Mm. Give it like a couple seconds for everybody to jump back on. I know YouTube is probably pushing a whole bunch of notifications out right now because we just went live three times in the last five minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Give me a thumbs up too so the uh, YouTube people can share this out. and uh, We're going to mind up a lot of knowledge right now since this is a uh, this is the first one, and I feel like we owe you guys a lot of knowledge up now because you're we screwed up the way. But you know, we'll get it better. We'll definitely get it better as time goes. And if this, if if everybody likes this type of stuff, then we're gonna do it on a weekly basis. We don't know exactly when and where and how yet. But it might even be like every Tuesday night or every Wednesday night or Thursday night or something like that. Um, King Isabel, thanks, nice. Corey. All right. Master Lockdown. That's uh that's Loke, right? Loke from Kansas. I think that's Loke from DTF. Uh, do you have any personally personal made soft plastics you'd recommend? Uh we don't. We fish store bought stuff all the time. So I mean, you pick a species, we can give you something you can buy. Uh, there's a lot of custom stuff that I have played with that I've bought from custom builders, but it, you get to that world of like, you pay twice, three times the price for it, and you don't always want to throw it, you know? So there's always that that world. Because uh, I'll be honest, I've bought, I bought some like uh, big top waters that I've paid, what, 70 bucks for? Each, I bought two. And I, it hasn't even touched the water yet because it's so beautifully painted. <laughs> it's stupid, I know, but I've done it, okay? Uh, probably the most expensive lore we throw uh, will probably be Rashi Glide right now. That's like $40 yeah. for one. Yeah, about 33 yeah. bucks. You throw that and you throw the Mega Bass drink bait, the 110s, they're like, a, they're like $25 a piece. And everything else is, you know, on the lower end of it. Um, yeah, David. Uh, yeah, our kayaks, we, we're due for kayaks, too. Our kayaks are pretty old. Uh, it's two. It's two. Twenty twenty, and I'm. I still have a twenty fourteen. I still have a twenty twelve. Twenty twelve. <laughs> yeah. Everybody else that fishes with us, everyone's rocking like twenty nineteen, twenty twenties. We're like, I'm the old school guys. We got the old side. Luke Skywalker is on. Of course, we throw frogs. Throwing frogs, man, dude. That was our. <laughs> that was our gateway drug into the whole bass fishing world, man. Pond fishing. Pond fishing. Like, like, uh, I remember catching. I remember going to the local pond. I caught two bass in one night, and I was like, "This was addictive. It was pretty addictive." So, and then after that, it was just like, "What else are they biting on?" You know. So we just started throwing frogs and threw flukes and uh, spooks, that type of stuff. Uh, and then uh, after that, the tournament world kind of started for this guy. I waited a whole year before I went, and the whole skunk story and everything is pretty crazy. But that's a story from another night. I mean, unless you guys have time for it. So the question is, I have issue finding bass after the water level level has gone up. Do you guys do to find fish after the water rise? Oh, well, yeah. usually if you just fish the good structure, there's always fish there. But when the water goes up, you kind of target before with, with the water line before the water went up. So let's say if the water went up like three foot, um, fish that old shoreline like three foot down, fish that. And then maybe you got a fish three foot from there, so maybe six foot deep, because maybe the fish was at three foot before the water went up. And sometimes they don't go up with the water. But a lot of deeper fish will move up to shallow water. It doesn't mean the shallow fish will move up into like six inches of water. So, you know, you gotta fish the old shoreline stuff. Um, I mean, don't, don't, I mean, you can't cross anything out. You gotta go flip the bushes and, you know, so. Yeah, so the other thing is I think I think that question has two parts to it. So if you if you know that like fairly well, then do exactly what he says because fish will kind of come up in stages, you can say. 
But if you're going to fish a lake you've never been to, like, for example, we fished the Oklahoma Kayak Anglers Tour, and those guys are real good, too. So when we go to a lake we've never been to, three, like, three hours out, right? So these lakes are maybe, like, 200 miles from home base. And you get there, and it just doesn't look right because, uh, say, it just rained two days ago, and the water's up, it's mud everywhere. What do you do? So for those situations, you have to rely on your, your, uh, your strengths. And our strength is not really fishing rising water. Okay, I'll be honest. So when that happens to us, uh, we tend to throw smaller stuff so we'll get bit on a tournament day. But if you have all the time in the world and, and the water's coming up, a good thing to look for is the banks that are more bluffier walls. Uh, stuff where the water can rise, but the water doesn't go far back. So that way, even though the fish is kind of crap is what I'm trying to get at. Versus like if you're fishing like standing timber and it goes, for every foot it goes up, it goes back 20 yards. That stuff is a lot harder. And if I had to fish that, I'm throwing a frog. That's my confidence bait. So I throw a frog. Some people throw a buzz bait. Uh, Cinco is always good. But like I said, if you throw on a Cinco, you know, on like light line, you might get bit, but it'd be hard to get them out. So that's kind of a, a gamble you have to take. But, uh, but yeah, that's actually a pretty good question, good question too. And the next question is, can somebody be able to use a swim bait or glide bait to catch striped bass? Yes. Um, all the time. All the time. So if we're fishing a lake or like hybrid striper with sand bass, uh, they're usually pretty deep, like 25 to right. 40. So right now, I need to do the video. Actually, I have it in the line. I just haven't done it yet. But uh, right now, my favorite lake to chase hybrids, they're staging post-spawn, of course, they're staging 25 to 35 foot of water, right? So my plan of attack is to go out there, grab them, find them, and then I'm throwing these at them. Number one is a swim bait, okay? Swim bait, three quarter ounce head. I'm, like, I'm talking about five inch swim bait, three quarter ounce, or even one ounce head, and just slow rolling and just hopping off the ground, or even a fluke might be okay too. If you want a more like finesse presentation, uh, the other thing would be uh, an A rig is great. So once again, that's like a big swim bait, right? And then all, oh, on top of that, yeah, a bunch of swim baits. And then a spoon. Throw a spoon at them, just stroke them off from the bottom. And that's my favorite way to catch them. But all that is, like, big presentations. I don't like the little three-inch swim baits. I mean, uh, the three-inch swim baits, yeah, we all – for the deeper water stuff, you want to go to the four and five and six yeah, inches. You step it up to a half ounce. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to keep it all on the bottom as you're reeling it. And when my spoons, I start off at a six-inch spoon. So I throw a six, a seven, and I have a couple of eights on standby the most parts, it's a it's a six inch spoon and 30, 40 foot of water, and it weighs like almost three ounces. So that's what I like to do. I hope I'm hoping to catch footage of that so I can share that with you guys because that world of spooning ocean like deep water, it's 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 awesome. Yeah, and then also on the glide bait, if they're shallow, I mean they're coming up to bus, you can throw a glide bait at them. But well, if they're busting, you probably will rather step it up to a uh, top water by then. But um, if you're fishing river systems and the fish are, I mean, it's only like seven feet deep and the water clear, you could pull those fishes up on a glide bait. It's just, they don't bite it every time. You probably get a lot of bumps and then maybe a hookup, but you know, the glide bait is kind of hit and miss bait and you have to have good conditions for a glide bait. Compared to a swim bait, they probably bite it almost every day. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so someone was asking about a striper lure. So for stripers, I think uh, the category is going to be dependent on how big of a, a striper you're chasing, because we've been, we've been on complete opposite ends, right? So in Oklahoma, there's no there's no minimum length. We have a number a maximum number of fish we can keep. So if you want to keep just you can actually keep a striper that's six inches long if you want to be, uh, but you can only keep five, right? Is it five mm -hmm. inches? Five, right? But in in um, in Massachusetts, it had to be twenty eight inches. A 28-inch fish in Oklahoma is a really good size. I mean, that's way above average, you know. So the, the, your lures are going to have to differ a lot. And if you – I think he mentioned you cranking at night too. So if you're, if you're downsizing it tonight, then what I like is – and I've, I've, we've already said this in a couple sooner like videos is I personally I – like, I like a bomber jointed 15A – they call it old. It's also an old school, which they probably don't make anymore. But if you see on eBay, just buy it or any yeah, any, but, any stick bait or like 
actual jerk bait one. Yeah, you that's the, all that work. works too. I've seen people catch them on rattle traps, but for the most part, it's a slow roll. Like it's like it's like that's only like one. It's like okay, so this is what we do. We do one good roll and then one slow, one fast, one slow. And that we just do that for the whole night and then just throw a jerk bait out. But for me, it seems like the, the jointed jerk baits they give off a lot more action. It's a little more like ticking sound to fish too, so they can find it a little easier. Um, but I know I know for for like the California guys, I know at least for the the, the mo people, they like to throw the realis, the dual realis, like one is either one ten or one twenty five uh, jerk bait. They say that's really really good. Um, but for me, I like the bombers, especially if it's night, it's pitch black, and you know you want to be real stealthy, but you want something that's rattling out there. That's a really good one. And it's not very expensive. I think it's only like seven ninety nine for one of those. So you know, so if you're picking stripers, the jointed ones at night, uh, that's what I would pick. That's my number one. Uh, Li Yang is any stripper at Beaver Lake Dam. Uh, Beaver Lake Dam. Pretty sure they have stripers. I never haven't fished it, but um, Beaver has stripers, so there should be baby stripers if you go to the dam. This yeah. just depends if you find them in the right spot. Mm -hmm. uh, any good lures you guys recommend for surf fishing at night time for stripers? Um, yeah, yeah, that I know. I know the glides should be good too because it's just it's just, it's just such a big presence in the water. That you know, stripers. I think stripers are most active at night. So, uh, if you if you size a, a, a jerk bait or a jerk bait glide bait for your size of striper, like for example, an eight inch glide bait for a thirty inch striper is sounds about right. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I shouldn't I shouldn't even have to talk more about that. Big stripers eat big baits. Okay. And if you get lucky, you might catch a 10-pound bass too. Right? <laughs> and yeah, what Luke said was right too. Depending on if I guess it's going towards if the water's up. Well, if there's a shad spawn, the shad's gonna spawn in those bushes and stuff like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's a bass question. I mean the stripers will be up there chasing the sand bass, and then the bass will be there too. Mm -hmm. So the bait will be up and they'll be blowing up on that. Right. Who but got the biggest Texas striper flow. between the two of you? You know, see, that's the thing, though. Officially, we never got official measurements, you know, so we just kind of took rough guesses. On his, you guys can go back in the channel and you can actually see it. Like, we actually, we have footage of that one. I think it's called Tuesday Night Throwback or something like that. We went to Sooner Lake. He caught Thursday Night, Thursday night Throwbacks, yeah. yeah. He caught a striper of beyond 40 inches. And at the time, we, we wasn't expecting to catch anything that big. And, and one of our friends, Andy, he had his tape measure that only went up to 40 inches, and it would be on that. And also his little hanger thing, yeah. it only went up to like 15 pounds. Yeah, it's not really and accurate. And it would be on that. So we're like, I don't know. I don't know for sure. <laughs> so the thing, I think it says 23 pounds and yeah. it's like 40, maybe 42 inches. Yeah, we're guessing like 40, 42, 42 inches. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a freshwater striper, which is huge, at least in our state. In our state, 42 is pretty big. Uh, I don't know many people. Maybe like I've heard stories and rumors of maybe like 10 people catching that quality of stripers. Uh, but me personally, freshwater, my biggest is only 37 inches. It's not that big. Uh, when it comes to saltwater, once again, I call it one of those over 40 inches. You call it one of those over 40. Mm -hmm. But that was that was like 12 years ago. And once again, we never got official measurements. I mean, maybe we got a couple yeah. photos. Yeah, a couple <laughs> photos and then it was off to the barbecue grill, you know? So so now we, we do more official like uh, keeping official me measurements because now we're in groups and we all like to brag about our fish and you know and shit like that. So, so we keep official measurements now. We take good pictures and we even have official rulers now too. So <laughs> nobody can say your fish is bigger than his fish if we're all using different rulers. So, so that's actually one thing. We got a group right now where we're trying to have. There's a group of us. It's kind of like uh, there's probably eight of us deep. We're all trying to catch a 40 inch this year, which is going to be really really hard. And uh, the seasons, be, it's coming into season where uh, we're going to start fishing at night. So you can, I, I want to bring some night fishing videos out, especially the striper stuff, because, you know, in, in my memories, my best memories of striper fishing has always been at night. But it's really hard to, to, to capture that night experience because <laughs> it's, it's pitch black. And you know, I've done it before. And it's pitch black. You don't hear nothing. All you all you see is the sound of us walking around, and that's better. Yeah, it's it's 
I have to get like floodlights or something going or some night vision going so I can't see it. But I want to introduce the whole night fishing because because night fishing is uh, it's one of the things that I like. Uh, honestly, my first striper was at night, so it was a big experience, and my personal best was at night too. So uh, I think a lot of people know the full moon in June is crazy for stripers, and even the full moon in July is pretty good. I know the uh, the full moon in August. In Cape Cod, if you're if you're watching from Cape Cod, let me know, because I know that bite is crazy. We went up there, and first time we went up there, we didn't know what we were doing really. We didn't study tides too much and the moon phases, and we kind of missed it. So well, at least we we got a taste of it. We didn't get the full exposure to it. But that full moon up in Cape Cod and the whole high tide, low tide thing going, or well, new moon actually, that 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 world is crazy. You go from like zero bites a day to like 50 bites in an hour on the right day. So, yeah, that, that's crazy, too. But I, I got to go back up and do that again. But COVID is kind of keeping me at home right now. Did you answer this one? Uh, what's that? Well, wiper fishing, is it better to match the hatch of bait fish or better to go with larger baits, for example, using a five or six inch or a three or four? Okay, so for for the for the for the hybrids and the wipers, you have to you know, you, you have to force yourself to use a smaller stuff. Uh, just because their mouth is, it's just not that big. I mean, I've caught them before with a six inch swim bait, but it seems like I miss five before I can catch one. Uh, and that's the only reason why I would say stick with the four and a half. Um, but I've seen them, they've smashed my seven inch swim before, and I've caught them inside the mouth. So, but once again, I do miss a lot of fish before I actually hook up on them. Uh, how's the striper sh fishing now? The striper fishing is good. Um, most of the dams are hitting top water now, and then Keystone is turning the waters on like a on and off schedule. Yep. So you have a low, pretty much water almost to like nothing, and then they'll turn they they'll generate. So the bites is on and off. So you gotta work around it and figure out the pattern. Yeah. Okay. So we also got like there's a good question from the other video that got canceled by us and we had to reload and all that stuff. Uh, some guy was asking about, uh, like, he's been in Oklahoma for two years, still hasn't caught a striper, he needs help, right? So, so I'll give you I'll give you two plans of attack, okay? So this is pretty much going to be guaranteed, okay? And it's going to be fun because you're going to see this top order hit and you're going to be like, that's crazy. But uh, one is you have to fish You have to fish the generation scale, schedule from the dams. So you have to look up Keystone. Look up, just Google Keystone SWT, which will be the official um, – uh, Army Corps website, and they'll kind of give you when the predictions are when they release water. So you fish Keystone, you follow Chin Killer, whatever, you know. But you have to fish one or two things either the, the running water, the release of the water, or you have to fish when it's completely dead. There's no water, they haven't been generating for a while, like at least 12 hours. Uh, so, and when they're generating, a lot of times when you go out there, you're, there's gonna be a lot of people out there, okay? So, so just kind of keep your space. It's COVID 16 foot apart type thing. But uh, go out there, throw a top water, throw a fluke and jig it. Just keep it that simple. You're going to catch them, okay? Uh, and if you see other people catching it, just try to mimic what they're doing, right? Just try to, you know, you know jig it exactly the way they're jigging it. Just don't get too close. People people kind of iffy out there. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, what do you call it, uh, river fighting kind of shit. <laughs> but, uh, but, the, but there's a lot of people. Now, the other thing is, the other thing, the other way is the, the complete 180, okay? You wait for the dams to shut off. And you let them shut off for a long time. And this is one thing not a lot of people know is when the dams shut off, the water has to go down, right? And when the water goes down, fish are forced into pools. And when they're fishing to, forced into pools, they get grouped up a lot. They get very competitive. So you can go out there, you can throw a top water, and look at a little small head and, you know, throw it out there as soon as it lands out there, just work it real fast and it tends to bite on the fast retrieve. You work it real fast and you'll get smashed. You know, you'll, you'll get smashed quick. If they're there, they'll smash it. It's like first cast and first pull, you'll, you'll get smashed. You'll mm -hmm. catch a striper. So um what's the best way to find bass in a lake with none to little cover? Um usually if you have side imaging that helps. Because yeah. if you can find like a offshore rock pile or in brush pile or something. They're usually there because they got nothing else to go to. So they're there. If not, then just beat the bank. 
Uh, it depends if the water is clear or not clear too. So if the water is clear, just throw a whopper popper, okay? Throw a whopper popper in one of those translucent colors. Is throw it as far as you can and just wind as fast as you can. Because clear water fish, you have to, you have to, you have to get that a reaction bite is what, is what I call it. And it's, I've done real well on that one too. Where you don't know what you're doing, but the water is too clear, and you, by the time you see the fish, you spook them up, right? So you have to bomb something as far as you can, and you power wind it quick. I'm talking like, I'm doing this on an eight gear ratio, or even a nine gear ratio, okay? Because you want the fish to see something coming across the surface, but you don't want them to see what it is. So one or two things are gonna happen. One, you're gonna leave it, or two, you're gonna come and smash it. And that's, that's the key to success sometimes in clear water. And it, even in bluebird days, and it's like 12 o'clock in the afternoon, you can still catch them that way. Um, other than that, if there's nothing there and it's muddy, they're going to be real shallow. Um, more than likely, it's going to be like a jig bite, something like that. So if it's muddy, they're always – and this is kind of a real rule of thumb for us too. And we got this from some of the professional anglers, uh, primarily Brett Ayler. And he said that he's only going to fish as deep as he can see the, the, the ground. So if, for example, if you can see down five feet, he's only going to fish five feet and maybe to 10, but not much farther than that. Because the fish, they, they kind of use that, uh, that darkness as an ambush too. And if they're hungry, they're going to be right at the edge of the, the light of the dark. So uh, that's, a, that's a really good point for, for, for finding fish in an area that has nothing. And so a lot of people say the lake might have nothing, but it actually does have something. So if you have one, if you have a good fish finder, uh, reference my fish finder on that, fish finder video on that, and it'll help you decide on what you want, what you can afford. And if you, if you, if there truly is nothing in that lake, you will find the fish even easier than finding brush and hoping in there. Because imagine if you're walking down the sidewalk and it's a perfectly clean sidewalk and there's three marbles on it, you're going to see the marbles really, really easy. Okay. So side imaging is a big deal. Uh, the off topic from JV says, what's the recommendation for a good budget boat for a person's first time owning a boat? Um, you can go into the kayak world like us. Yeah. It's a little cheaper. Yeah. Uh, John boat's pretty good if you're fishing river or shallow water. Right. So I think it depends on what you want to do with it. Yeah. So if you if you're if you're if you're say doing mainly ponds, uh, smaller lakes, a John boat is by far the best starter boat. Because it's cheap, you buy you buy a brand new, it's nine hundred bucks. You get a brand new trailer, it's like five hundred. You put an outboard on it, it's two thousand five hundred. Trolling motors five hundred. You get a brand new boat. And when you're brand new to boats, to the boat world, uh, you don't want to be fixing stuff all the time because it, that's what is very discouraging to a lot of people. They'll get into the boat world and they'll spend like five grand on a big twenty foot fiberglass boat, and they get it home. And it's maintenance after maintenance. There's lower unit problems, car electrical car problems, car problems. Before you know it, you're like $5,000 into maintenance, and then you get a real bad taste in your mouth, and you're like, screw the boat world. I'm done. I'm out, you know? So you kind of want to go into it with a good, you know, good from a good angle. And also, if you're just doing, like, if you're just fun fishing with your friends uh, and, you, and your budget's really low, a kayak is really, really hard to beat. Kayak has no maintenance. It's zero maintenance, especially if you buy a kayak that you can throw on top of the roof of your car. It's zero maintenance. It's, it's made out of plastic. You got there, you pedal, and then that's it. You bring it home, you throw it on the side of the house, and it's done. You know, the next time you go out, it's ready to go again. A boat, I mean, even our little John boat, there is maintenance. You got to do oil changes. You got to do prop changes. I mean, even for a little boat, it is it is maintenance. So I do spend about three hundred dollars a year. On just maintenance, where the kayak, it's the only time I do any maintenance on it is like, uh, so if you run Hobies, we have these cool little drive things that do this, and we hit a lot of stumps. So we'll bend these legs out, and then we just have to re bend them back. Or, or if we re bend them back two, three times already, we'll have to go and buy those uh, shafts again, brand new shafts. And we replace them about once a year. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. maybe once a year. Uh, I carry spares just in case, but they're like $60 for two. And let's see how cheap that has got compared to the 300. Plus, there's no probably no registration. Okay, so in our state, there is no registration, so you don't have to pay that registration fee every year, also. But 
That's a good question. I should probably do a video on that. You Comments guys guy fishing with subscribers? Uh, we don't guy fish yet because we're too busy working. <laughs> but eventually, maybe, I think eventually we're gonna guide. Maybe we'll we'll be guiding. Uh, not just striper fish. I mean, bass fishing, striper fishing, well, yeah, sand we'll, bass we'll fishing. Do all types of things. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we could put out jugs, <laughs> jug line, jug you know, jug line guide fishing. Definitely. Well, okay, so so I thought about that a little bit too. If we weren't gonna do guide fishing, it'll be uh, definitely stripers, definitely white bass for sure. Bass fishing maybe because there's so many different. More of a it won't. If I was doing the guide thing with bass, it won't be a really guide. It'd be more like a coach. You know, you go out and I just kind of tell you this is what I would have done. Or this is what you do wrong. Or you know, do this and do that versus put, I'm just gonna put you all on fish and it's luck by thought, you know. It's like you know, we're not gonna do that with bass. So um <clears throat> Master Lockdown said his buddy caught 14 striper as sooner. That's believable because I yeah. broke a big one. So we broke him off. Well, he <laughs> broke off a monster. We have bigger than that 40 that could turn it, you know. Same night too, right? Yeah, yeah, same like night the too. cast or two before that. Yeah, we didn't get that on. Yeah, so you guys get a right there. Oh, uh, do we so use JD and Surfra like the Shimato, whatever dye? Yeah, we uh, there's a I almost I almost bought the dye rod one time. Uh, it was called the, what was it called? But it was designed for like the the, the Japanese striper that they have over there. What was called? But it was like a five hundred dollar rod and super light came with the, the the Fuji AGS guides, which was our carbon, which are the proprietary dye carbon fiber guides. And the only reason why I did not buy it is because if I ever had a problem with it, the United States would not warranty it. So you'd have to send it all the way back to Japan. And by the time you do that, and plus you don't speak Japanese, so it's not going to be worth it. So if you're going to spend that amount of money, like if I'm talking, if, if you're talking JDM rods, I'm talking 500 up, right? Look into the world of custom rods, okay? Uh, go get a reputable rod builder. And have them measure your, your arm and have them build you a custom rod. And that's fit for you. Yeah, it's yeah. fit for you because even with our surf rods, I'm already starting to get away from the factory surf rods. I'm starting to look into the custom surf rods right now. And we have a whole rod builder thing going. In the East like, for example, my 13 foot surf rod, like he can't handle it. Yeah, I, he I can't, can't fling those like yeah. lures the same way I can because I'm taller, I'm stronger, my arm length is a little longer. Course it was longer. I could torque that rod better, right. and everything's a little different. So, you could build a rod that you don't have to torque as hard to get that cast. Right. So, and, and it, it, there, there's a little science to a rod too. So, like for example, like for me, I can't handle anything over an 11 footer, but he likes a 13, and also the rod action. When when put it this way, I can't put enough force behind my rod. But he can. So for for us, if you're if you're like a medium caster guy, kind of like me, you want a rod that's more like whippy. Where his he likes more stiffer rods because when you put a lot of power behind a stiff rod, it can actually deliver more power to the lure. But you know you have to kind of think about what you like also. So and then also the other thing, what are you trying to do with it? You know, if you're throwing throwing like a one ounce, two ounce, three ounce. That really, really comes into play too. Uh, so, because you don't want to have too light of a rod and throw in a heavy action, not yeah, heavy action, throw in a heavy bait, and you know, vice versa. So, sometimes it boils down to two rods, and that's what I've kind of actually come to. I carry two rods. I don't know if you have watched my other videos or fishing at the dam, but I carry two rods. I carry a black 11 footer, which is a, a dowel ballistic, and it's got an aerotechnium on it. And nothing casts forever, but the thing is, it's pretty heavy. I don't like to throw too much. And then I also have a red uh, St. Croix uh, Avid, and I have a Dio uh, Cert Tape, 3,500 on it. So a 9-footer and an 11-footer. I fish the 9-footer a lot, unless if I got to like, do that 100-yard cast, then I'll bring out the 11s because the 11 can get that, and the 9 can even be close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, you guys could join the 40 inch club. I mean, once you catch it, just post it up on yeah, our yeah. page and our YouTube, uh, Facebook page and hey, join the 40 club. So, yeah. 
Uh, fishing is dope. How is my boy Her Jay Hyung adapting to the Oklahoma fishing? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we fish with him almost every other weekend. So yeah, we haven't fished with him. He's actually our first yeah. cousin. Like mm-hmm. his dad and our dads are brothers, so yeah. uh, we're we're first cousin. And and uh, he's he's good. He's getting along. He's he's um, um, fishing one of our favorite lakes. Pretty right. good. He's still he's still a very finesse guy. And we keep telling him you gotta throw square bills. You gotta throw like big worms. You gotta throw big jigs. And you gotta throw it on twenty pound line. You gotta throw it on sixty five pound line. And he's all like, uh, "My ten, my twelve is good." <laughs> no, but like, uh, he's a good fisherman. And he's a good fisherman. Coming from California to Oklahoma is totally like night and day almost. I mean, bass is still bass, but you know you catch it on single. But other than that, if it's the finesse game, you know, you're always good at the finesse yeah, game. But finesse game. you know you gotta learn the power fishing game with the frog or the buzz bait, which is different out there, you know, and I mean, his glide baits and uh, Huddleston skills are probably better than, way better than ours because we oh, don't yeah. throw that at all. Yeah. So we're yeah, still learning that. Sure. Yeah. So um, he's doing good. He's just fishing lakes, and we've been doing our online tournament, which just ended last month. So we haven't had much time to fish with him, yeah. but we will pick that back up. I'm uh, probably going to fish with this weekend, actually. PB Strapper is about a 42 inch landlock out of a single lake. Yep. Uh, we have one, I have another one that. It's not landlocked that ran up the river to spawn back in Massachusetts that probably went for 40 inches and yeah. broke plenty that was bigger than that. So yeah. no, we know. And at the time our gear was just a seven foot ugly stick with 20 pound <laughs> monofilament and tri- big game tri- 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 Yeah, and we're straining out hooks still. So yeah. it's like our gear now is totally yeah. different from then. So if we have a year today, that fish was coming in, you know, it wasn't really any big deal. Uh, let's see. Aaron Moore, how do you locate striped bass from a kayak or boat in the lake in the summer? Okay, that one. Okay, so this is a this is like a this is actually gonna be part three to uh, one of the video series, fish finder series that I'm putting out. But I'll give you the nugget right now because uh, we with the guys that fish the dams a lot. The reason why they fish dams is like literally that the fish can't go beyond the dams. So they get there, they get caught. Basically, that's why so many people focus their attention on dams, but. If you're good, if you're if you have your mindset on the lake already, this is what you gotta look at. Okay, so is your lake like a lake or is it like what do you call it, a highland reservoir where they pull water? Like a TVA lake. Yeah, like, like a TVA lakes or like generation tar- lake. Generation, like water generation, lakes, yeah. Yeah, man-made lakes. Okay, so but regardless, it's all based off of points, points, rock piles, things like that. Humps, ambush, Humps, ambush points, and the stripers they like to. A lot of times you'll find them like suspended. Okay, so you can be like 50 foot of water, but you'll see this big group of stripers like 10 feet off the water and they're just chilling off the bottom. Off the bottom. They're not doing anything from like uh, say 11 to 3 in the afternoon. They're not doing anything. They're just sitting there. And a lot of people say that's the hardest time to catch them. Well, I, I, I say that's the easiest time to catch them because I think everybody knows that during the day, right? This is typically how striper fishing goes on the lake. Everybody's out there early, like three o'clock in the morning. Everyone's throwing like a crankbait or a drake bait, and they're just all lying it, like I like was mentioning before with the bomber. And you'll you'll catch them. You'll catch them up until about seven and eight. As soon as the sun comes out, they just disappear, right? So so you know, based on the two things I just told you, between eleven and three, they're all deep. But in the morning, they're all shallow. So you got to understand that the fish move shallow to eat, and then they go out to chill. Okay, so if you got a boat, that's the best thing you got to run in that you can run into. If they're just sitting there, yeah, Bigfoot knows that we can go. But uh, if you if you find the fish out deep, number one thing is throw a spoon, okay? Throw a big spoon. Uh, that's what I love doing. I love to find fish that are suspended because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get a reaction bite, okay? Because they're not hungry. If they're just sitting there chilling, you can throw a live bait down there. They might not even buy it, okay? They might not even like, look at it. But the thing about this big spoon is it, it does all this weird action as it's falling, and you literally want to hit them on the head, okay? When you hit one on the head, it'll dart off, and it'll cause that school to fire. When that school fires, every time you let that spoon go down there, it's, it's, it's bit bite after bite after bite. And that's something that I've done before, but I've never been able to capture it on video. So that's something I'm trying to show this, this year. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. That's what I, I look for. In the morning, I fish out like everybody else. And then at 11, 12, I go deep. I go try to go find the schools. Sometimes they're on the bottom, but a lot of times when you get there, you'll see the humps come up a little bit and then go right back down to the ground. 
that striker, especially if you mark it on uh, on two E sonar side imaging or even down imaging. You will see. And the thing is, okay, here's the other thing that uh, in the beginning, I think for me personally, uh, that was a mistake that helped you guys out a lot is when you first see like a small group of fish, don't don't stop. You know, just keep going. Like look at all the points on the lake and then come back to the spots that you think have the biggest concentration of fish. Because when I first started, I'll see a school of five and I just fish it for like an hour. Then I'd miss a school of 50, like 50 yards out there. You know, so now what I do is I go check my spots. I check this point, I check that ditch, I check that hot spot. I mean, that, that hump, I'll check some foundations. I'll check this one spot right next to the peak channel. And then depending on what, look, what, it, what looks good, I'll come back and I'll fish it, you know. But if you're on a kayak, you have no electronics, points, number one, points. Uh, if you don't have no electronics, the thing you can do is uh, there's an app on your phone you can buy. It's called Navionics. It's a GPS mapping system. And you can just, just go to the points and just start throwing, you know, your traditional flukes. Spoons. You, you might catch them even, even without seeing them down there. Uh, Trekking Fisherman said the new moon is crazy action at the Cape. See, that guy knows what he's talking about right there. Yeah. Uh, David Chang said just moved here since October, haven't had a chance, haven't caught it. Sharper. And your other uh, question was where to catch Sharper? You gotta fish where there's Striper that lives. Like all, all along the Arkansas River has Striper. So the lakes above the Arkansas, where, where the rivers are connected to the Arkansas, might not have strippers. So if you go like to Uga or to Tank Hiller or you go to Fort Gibson, those lakes don't have strippers. But below the river, like below the dam, they do have strippers. So like if you want to go to the best concentration of uh, striper, you got to go to the Arkansas River. And on, on top of Keystone has it because Keystone, they, they stock striper into Keystone. And then... I guess it went down the river and then now it's everywhere. <laughs> they must have stocked it at like US Kerr and all that. That's why the whole Arkansas River has striper back in like the 70s. Right. So yeah, you gotta fish a river that has striper. Um good areas if you're here in Tulsa is uh down down, Tulsa. down by the gathering place, you <laughs> the know. Gathering place is just, park, just park by the gathering place and walk down to the river. I think it might be closed now because of that flood last year, but across the across the river. There's a soccer field, and you can park over there and walk to the river and fish. If not, just go to Keystone when the water's off. You can walk out there. It's not even deep. Those pool looks deep, but they're probably like waist deep. I mean, we used to cross it. So um, asterisks on that because we do have a. I think his name is Ronnie. I can't. I think I believe it was Ronnie. He was, he was a, a subscriber too. He went out there and he got caught off guard, and the water started running through, and he said he was fighting for his life for a couple minutes there. So if you're going to do the Arkansas River thing, just do us a favor. Just wear a life jacket, right, guys? Because a lot of times the water generation comes on and the bell might be too far away. You don't hear this bell. And before you know it, the water is up like three feet and you didn't make it back to the bank yet. Yeah. So if you're going to go out there, wear a life jacket. I know it looks really, really stupid for someone to walk on land with a life jacket, but it could save your life. And now Ronnie has them every time he goes out. Yeah. So. Yeah. So be sure to wear a life jacket. But yeah. That spot's crazy. Uh, downtown Tulsa, basically, there's a dam that's there, and then all the stripers they just come and stay there all year. Uh, top water. Bay boy, boy Bassin said. Bay Boy Bassin, yeah, guys, local too. Yeah, go check out our boy Bay, Bay, Bay Boy Bassin. What's He's your favorite lure for if you only had one? Uh, I throw a lot of worms for bass fishing now, and then if you talk about a striper, it's probably a swim bait, but I've been throwing swim bait for the bass too. So yeah. if you want to target both, just throw a swim bait. But um, if you want to strictly target a bass, for me, it's just throw a worm. I mean, I've been throwing, I've been doing good on shaky head. So a worm or a net, which is still a half a worm, but still a worm. What's yours? Uh, if it's striper and bass, well, actually, let's just make striper or bass, right? Now, for stripers, I say an A ring, and you can't beat it. We have, we have so much footage on it. I've been beaten by it so many times. Yeah, just throw an A-Rig. It works all day, all night. It don't matter what time of year. They just smoke that thing. Okay, so that's striper fishing. Uh, if it's bass fishing, I like I like frogs, man. I like topwater frogs. I mean, you know, I saw my best memories. Some of my personal biggest bats, we call them frogs. I love frogs. 
sunfish for sunfish for fish. Uh, Bigfoot lives at Keystone. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Never knew. And then, hey, hey, side note, right? We watched, we listened to this podcast called Sasquatch Chronicles. Woo! Might get on the show. They got time. some scary stories on that. So you gotta go just go check it out. You won't be the It's all complicated. Yeah. Uh, do we fish at Coal? Uh, we did a couple times. Uh, it's kind of out of the way, about maybe two hour drive for us. So we usually go to Sooner and then we do skunk, then we might go to Coal. But most of the time, if you already skunk at Sooner, then That's you gotta bad. make another. Thirty minute walk back, and then another thirty minute drive to call. And yeah, so. by the time you done it like yeah. twice, three times. So, yeah, we yeah. we do fish call, but it's just here and there. We usually skunk that call too, though. Yeah, like if you guys want to do call, uh, go to our guys DTF Outdoors. Those guys are from Kansas, and they hit call on almost like a regular basis, so they know a lot more about that area than if you're in the Kansas. He was actually in the comment section too. Yeah. His name is Master Lockdown. You'll, you'll just just look to Master Lockdown. You'll yeah, so if you're in the out. Kansas area, Master Lockdown, Lockdown South Kansas, Kansas Central area, area, they hold it down up there too. That's who you contact. Laws. Yeah. Um, what's up, my Pete's Bay casting for beginners. Oh yeah. I can never figure out. You get an SD spool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So, so the Bay Caster rule, right? So okay, that is a very very good question because uh, before we got into bass fishing, we could care less about the Bay Caster. But there's a big but, okay. So a lot of people will say, why would you ever want a bait caster when a spinning reel can do everything the bait caster can do? Well, that's just because you're ignorant and you don't know what it's capable of. The bait caster, think of it like this: you put if you could put 20 pound line, I'm talking plastic lines, right? Like fluorocarbon or mono on a small spool, there's no way that thing's gonna throw more than 40 yards, right? So for for, for the most part. Uh, you, you want smaller line, less than 10 pounds, eight, six, four, spinning reel, right? Or if you go with the braid, the braid equivalent, 15, 20, 30, you wouldn't really go over 30, okay? But on the bay caster, it was designed to carry big line. Like for, I mean, our spools on the bay caster, they're not really big, but you can pull, you put 25, 30 pound if you want on there. And on the braid side, I fish 80 pound braid on my frogs. So that's the benefit of it, okay? So, so with that going out of the way, you have to understand what you're getting yourself into. The bait caster is also a lot faster. It's a lot gear ratios. So for a spinning reel, you turn it one time, it cranks in, what, 25 inches, 25, 26, for a traditional size. I'm not talking the surf reel. Surf reel is different. But your traditional, like, Shimano Stratics, 2,000, 3,000s, every crank of the handle, you reel in, like, 25, 26 inches per turn. On a bait caster, you can get them so you reel in 40 inches per turn. So it, it, the opposite, the, 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 uh, if you depending on what type of fishing you're doing, but uh, if you're fishing one of those situations where you really got to crank really fast, like I said, the clear water situations, a bait cast will definitely keep you from getting fatigued compared to a, a spinning reel. Plus, you have to, yeah, yeah, and the other thing too, yeah. <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the ergonomic side, right? The it's literally a button press versus, right? It's 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 just better set up, it's faster, you get like. Three out of three, it's a lot faster, um, and it's got a lot more power too. So that's one thing that, like, yeah, unless you've fished it, you understand. When I say power, I mean cranking power. Like on a spinning roll, when you crank, it struggles to crank. On a on a bait cast, you crank, it's smooth. It just it just pulls it in, you know. Yeah, it's um, just a mini winch. Yeah, it's a winch. I mean, it's it's crazy, and you can't figure it out. Um, it's simple. We have a video on that, but I need to do an update on it. We do another video on that. It's, yeah, it's basically, super there's two knobs on it. Typically, well, I'm fishing left hand knob, but the knob on where the handle's at, right? And you start with that knob. So you turn that knob until you have to fill your spool while you're turning this little knob, right? So you're, 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 you're kind of filling the spool, make sure it slides left and right. And then you keep turning this knob until it doesn't move left and right anymore. And then you go like another quarter turn. That's, that's a good spot to start, okay? And then if you're just pitching, like, within 15 yards, you don't even need to mess with the magnetic drag at all. It should not backlash on you, right? Because that's the – that spool, it's called a spool tension knob. That knob helps you with, like, short casts. So you can even turn the magnet completely off. It'll be fine. But the magnet comes into play when you need to make a long cast. So when you make a long cast, then you want to start with that magnet on max. 
and start with heavy. Yeah, yeah. and start yeah. with like uh, you need to practice in your backyard. I recommend a half ounce weight and put some cheap line on it because your back lasts a lot. So like go to Walmart or whatever and pick up like fifteen pound catfish line and practice with that. Teabing, what size boat do you guys get? Um, if we get a new bow, it'll be a big boat. <laughs> right now we have like a fourteen foot John boat. You guys see it on the channel all the time. We do some damage on that thing all the time. But my next boat, right? So, so we kind of have we kind of like since we are we are a YouTube channel, we're trying to do fishing all the time, and we try to do different situations and things like that. So we have kayaks. So kayaks is covered. We have a top of the line kayak, the two kayaks in the mud. For those years, 2012, 2014, that's the most expensive kayak you can buy. It probably still is right now, right? The Holy Wrangler. Yeah, it still is, but it's outdated, but. You can still keep up with it, guys. And then yeah. as for a boat, we have a 14 foot with a 10 horsepower on it. That was my first boat, and it's a good starter boat for me. But quickly it started becoming not fast enough, not big enough, not you know, not able to carry enough equipment. So for our next boat, it'll be a big boat. It'll be a big boat. I'm looking at a 20 foot with like a 200 horsepower on the back. That's what I want because I want to do a lot of things. Uh, and I, I, I want to keep it aluminum so that way I can still run the rivers and I can run bass tournaments with it. So it's a multi species boat. But you kind of have to look at what you want to do. If you do tournaments, you got to have high horsepower. It's just no way around it. You got to have high horsepower. Uh, but if you're not, then um, you know, 90 horsepower is more than enough. You know, 40 is going to be fighting for you. Yeah, I'm a 10 horsepower motor. That's it's going to get us 20 miles power. So David said, uh, is a Sun dolphin kayak good? Uh, no, not really. They're not really good. Yeah, at all. that's a that sounds like a newbie question. So let me address the I guess the kayak decision by right. So this is a this is a question that our cousins ask us all the time. You know, like I want to get a kayak. Is a three hundred dollar kayak good? It's, it's, it's a good question. You know, but 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 I have to say, you know, okay. So are you are you pretty good at fishing already? And you try to get into the world, the world or are you just like I just want to have fun on the lake, and hopefully I can, you know, paddle around a little bit. So that's two totally different things, because we have so many stories where people uh, we we call bank beaters, and that's we are too. Before we advance the boat world, where you have good equipment, right? I'm talking like a setup that's 200 bucks. That's, that's good equipment, rod and reel, 200 bucks. So you imagine you you're gonna go on a kayak, right? So you're gonna carry like four rods now, right? So you, then you're talking 800 dollars worth of equipment, and your kayak might flip. Okay, when your kayak flips, all that is gone, basically. And they've hired, what, at least five or six stories about that already? Mm -hmm. People losing thousands of dollars worth of equipment because they didn't buy a proper fishing kayak. So definitely look at the fishing kayaks. Sun Dolphin doesn't make one, by the way. Uh, the brands we recommend, I mean, it, we run pro anglers from Hobie, but there's a lot of good options right now. Ever since 2016, the, the industry has shifted. And just about every company has a fishing kayak now. So I just tell people that. buy a kayak with a foot pedal or like propel drive or something. Yeah. Something like that because you don't want to pedal away your arm and paddle away your arm and then cast yeah. and then paddle again. You see, that's so, a good point because yeah, we have just, a lot of friends that buy a pedaling kayak, no, a paddle kayak, and they upgrade it to a pedaling kayak. Within so, a year, you know. So, so just buy one so you don't have to buy again because you'll lose money in the long run. So just buy a good one. Heading in Keystone tomorrow. Any tips on a striper down there? Usually fish call. Uh, striper, try to hit top water in the morning right. um, before their sun comes up. That's usually the bite. But if they're running water, you could drift flukes with maybe like an ounce, an ounce and a half. Yeah, Keystone, so Keystone is a very, it's right. very bipolar sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so you have to well, well go back and watch your video. But if I was going to Keystone tomorrow, this is what I would bring. I would bring a surf rod and something that could go really, really, really far. Because if they're releasing the little floodgates, you want to hit the floodgates, and that's where the bite, the big bite, at least, yeah. is yeah, surf rod, surf rod, uh, weighted top waters. Go watch that video too. How to make your top waters go farther? How we drill our baits and we stuff them with BBs and everything. Make sure you got a couple of those. Other than that, you know, you drift the fluke. The fluke always never disappoints. Um, rattle traps. I've caught them on rattle traps a lot. Swim baits. Swim baits. Drifting swim baits. Cast it's pretty good. Yeah. 
So yeah, pretty much anything. That's right there. Uh, if they're blowing up on Shad in the middle of nowhere, you just gotta reach them. They'll buy it. Mm-hmm. But the hard part is to reach them. Well, say says SP Minnow or Hydro Minnow. Hydro Minnow, definitely Hydro Minnow. I haven't used the Hydro yet, but the SP Minnow is good. Yeah. Cats is good. Ever considering a DC reel? Uh, we're big into the Daiwa stuff. I mean, Shimano is good too, but yeah. we're running Steezes SVs, so it's not really a Chichula. Once you go the Steez SV, and mm-hmm. nothing really compares it <laughs> for light stuff. I mean, we we. T- traditional Texas rig or something heavy, regular reels are fine. It's just when you go and step into a DC or yeah. SV reel, that's when you throw like a weightless single on like 10 pounds, yeah. like super finesse. So the, it makes a good beginner yeah. reel too because it doesn't backlash a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but for me, for me, I've actually been asked that question before. You know, do you, do you like the SV system or the Shimano DC? Because that seems to be the hot topic right now. And my my argument to that is we are tournament fishermen, and we fish in all conditions. So if you're going to tell me there's a little microchip on it that can rust out while I'm fishing in the rain, I'm totally against that. Because the, the Shimano, like I said, the DC system is an electronic chip of some kind. It makes that wee sound when you cast it. I don't even know. I, I've never seen it fail, but it's just one of the things in the back of my mind, right? So there's a chance of failure versus... If you buy the die ones, it's all magnetic. It's mechanical. There's no electronics. It won't fail on you, you know? So at least that's that's my take on it. And I say the magnetic is going to be more reliable, so I go that route. But regardless, it's gotten to the point where it's just personal preference. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can't go wrong with either one. Like, oh, like I said, but mainly DC and SV are built for, like, super lightweight stuff. Kind of like super instead of... Throwing it on a spinning tins. reel, you throw it on a SV yeah. a reel or a DC reel. That's if you're, you're going to buy a DC to cast a chatterbait or a spinnerbait or a jig, I think you're wasting your money. Yeah. Okay. If you're going to throw a net or a yeah. finesse swim bait yeah. or maybe even drop shot because you don't want to mm-hmm. throw it on mm-hmm. you know, yeah. that um, fairy wand, then yeah, yeah that's yeah. where it comes I have, come I have two steezes. And they're like four hundred dollar reels. I throw net rigs. I throw two pointed kite tags on. Yeah, it, right? that's, that's the that's the whole point of that reel, you know. So that's that's why that's why I use those expensive reels for. Yeah. Um, nice win last week. Thanks, man. Thanks, Richard. Mm-hmm. Menu the menu. When y'all cast, do you get both the same distance? Despite being one thirteen and one ten. No, the thirteen no. out way out through the ten. No way. Uh, the only time you struggle more with the 13 if you're throwing like a bomber, which is only an ounce, and that 10 footer will throw it better than the 13 because that 10 footer is built to throw lighter stuff. So the cast oh, casting ounce. lighter stuff with that 10 footer is actually better than the 13. Oh. So the the 13 is really only good for bombing like hot water, like Three ounces. Yeah, yeah, 150 yards out there. Yeah. So yeah. that's about it. Yeah, the, so that, that's why I carry two rods. I carry nine and a half, and I carry an eleven because anything like uh, bobber, nighttime cranking, you know, drifting the fluke, that type of stuff. The nine and a half is way better. It's lighter. It's more controllable. Uh, you know, all that stuff. But it comes a time where you're gonna have to make that cast, that long cast. And we've seen it time and time again, where they are biting a hundred yards out. If you can't get out there, hang up the rod and just watch the show, okay? Because you ain't getting bit, all right? So there was a time and a moment for either rod. And, yeah, the longer rod tends to throw better than the shorter rod, assuming you have the same line and the same reel. Now, if, if it's different combinations, then it can matter a little bit more. But assuming everything else is the same, the longer rod typically throws a little bit longer. You guys, do you bottom bounce cherry bait, though? All the time, 90% of the time. Uh, mainly, it's more. <laughs> well, like yeah, it's Ernie. Ernie was. I think Ernie is the one that was talking about how he never catches a, a chatterbait. Yeah, so chatterbait fishing yeah. when they're um, yeah, for bass. So like, hey, strapper and sand bass. Yeah, my so bass. Many, oh, my bass. Everything hits chatterbait. Yeah, but uh, chatterbaits for like the pre-spawn for their up and spawning, the bass is gonna be shallow, and you could kind of almost burn the chatterbait and mm-hmm. they'll hit it. And but right when they spawn. For some reason, they don't touch it. You don't really get bite on. I mean, you'll 
you'll catch the peace form that are moving up, but you're not going to catch the big wave. So it's not, it's kind of like a dying pattern or not the dominant pattern. So we don't throw chai very much, but when they go back into peace, uh, post, post bond, it's fire again. yeah, it's fire again. Yeah. And then even in middle of summer, people don't throw it, but it's, it's fire, fire again. again. Yeah. So, so that's, is... that's when the bottom bouncing comes. Like you throw it out there and you, instead of like, it's not like dragging on the bottom, but you just kind of sweep your rod. It's a fast one. Yeah, like you sweep your rod, reel your really slack, and let the let the chabit hit bottom and sweep your rod again. And then same thing over and over, let the chabit hit bottom. And you'll when you, when you sweep, you'll feel the vibration in your chabit. But when it when your chabit drop, it glides. It just don't drop straight. It glides, and they're either hitting that reaction from it vibrating up or the gliding fall. And they're, 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 they're hitting something like that. So. That's, that's a deal with you. That's a big nugget for you guys to chime in tonight because you want a lot of money doing that. Okay. I want a lot of money just straight burning it too, but most of the money I want has been like casting it out, let it hit the bottom. Sweet. Real. Sweet. And a lot of times, as soon as you sweep and you stop it, stunk. Just hit them hard. You got them. And do it on a clean bottom. Yeah. Clean bottom. Um, like mud. Grass. Well, it's fine. Around it's grass is good. Uh, don't do it around standing timber. Standing timber is a nightmare. Rocks is yeah. okay, but you'll probably donate some. And we're, we're mainly throwing ch jackhammers, so yeah. they're like a $15 base. Yeah, go, go check out my uh, my jackhammer review on that because I put all those details in that video. I mean, I put my heart and soul in that video. Everything, every secret I got is in there. Trailers and everything, too, which I only run basically one trailer. Yeah, but you just got to go out and throw a chat bait. You know, it's just any lore you picked up. You got to Spend enough time. Like, if the best way to catch a fish on a new lure is when they're busting, you throw that lure in there and you catch them. So you feel how that lure is running, how the how a bite actually feels. So you know when you're getting bites on that lure. That's how you build the best confidence and the fastest confidence on the bait. Mm -hmm. uh, you lost PV for strikers? 40? Bass, 40 roughly? Just pretty much. A little bit bass. I just yeah. caught my. 24 this just weekend. Just personal bass. So I'm guessing like a seven. I didn't weigh it because it was too hot. You know, you know that bass. If it was like at, well, the thing is, he caught a bass that was beyond its prime too. So yeah. That bass at its prime, just based on its head. Yeah. The head is over good. 10 pounds. Over like no problem. Over 10 pounds. But it felt like it was one of those big old headed fish, a little slender body. You know, it probably weighed seven. But if it was, I'm thinking 12 pounder prime. You know. Um, so yeah, that's that's his personal best. My personal best, uh, I caught two 24s, I caught one in Lake Cork, and I caught one in Connell. They're both in videos too. Just go back in the playlist and you'll see it. Um, but yeah, caught them on a 5XD in Connell, caught on a 10 inch worm in Texas. That was the first time. Like, I've never caught a bass over 20 inches, and then I catch a 24 in Texas. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy <laughs> during the tournament, too. And I didn't even win big bass. <laughs> <laughs> that was on Fort though. That was on Lake Fort. Yeah, that was Fort. Yeah. Like that. If you want big striper to come to Tennessee every year, you can catch a 40 plus easily. If you know the spots, guys catch them at least once or two around 60. I will take your word on that. And we are coming to Texas because the goal is the goal is to grow the channel so it's big enough so we can actually become one of those other like cool YouTube channels where we just travel the country fishing. And one of my goals, and I'll let it, I'll let it out the cows back right now, is I want to do a 50 states in 50 weeks, like traveling show, basically. Probably not 50, but like maybe 48. Yeah, yeah 48 <laughs> in 50 weeks, because he's two, two weeks off, right? So that means, what does that mean, right? We're going to hit Texas, we're going to hit Florida, we're going to hit Tennessee, we're going back to the Cape for sure, we're going to go to Montana, catch some weird trout up there, whatever it needs to be. Probably go fish the salt lake and get stumped because no no freaking life over there. But you know, you know what I mean? Like we want that's our that's our end goal with this channel. So that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Definitely gonna come to Tennessee. I see those videos where you guys are just smashing giants at the dams, and you guys don't even have like uh off off living areas like our dams. Like, our dams have to be 50 yards back. You guys actually go right up to the dam and you just drop the motor down. It's crazy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're definitely hitting Tennessee by the time. That happens. I hope I already had my 20 foot uh, boat with a 200 on the back, and I'll tow that all around the country in the Tacoma. I'll probably be twin turbocharged by that time. What happened to our Hobie Outback? The Hobie, Hobie still got it. Yeah, yeah that's still got it. We still can use it. So it's a garage queen. It's a garage queen right now. 
It's only been out twice. Um, we're gonna do a rigging video. Yeah, so that's the other thing too. Uh, it is the hopefully you can still uh, I still need to pick parts of Luke, but uh, we're gonna do a build your kayak in ten minutes type of video. And I'm trying to get all the GoPros kind of situated, get the lighting just right, because uh, I want to do that right now. I think that hasn't hit the kayak world yet. I know the, the car world, they're doing builds that are like six months long, but it's all time lapse and it's all like, and then ten minutes later you have a pretty beat ass you know car. I want to do that with a kayak too. So the the Hobie, uh, we actually won that. I won that at uh, the BBKC tournament. I placed second. We won a we won a Hobie uh, Outback, and we haven't really used much. I think it's been out like said twice or three times. I use the drive in my pro angler, but that's that's all we do. So we're gonna do a video on how to rig up a badass kayak. Cause uh why not? You have pieces just lying around, so you might as well do something with it. How important is it to have the right type of line for the type of fish you're catching? Um you can catch fish on any line you want, but mainly your line yeah. interferes with the bait you're throwing. So if you're throwing a diving bait or one that's in the water column or on the bottom, you want to throw fluorocarbon. And then if you want to throw something that's floating, they want to throw monofilament or braids. But then you could go into the braided leader, which you could change up your leader from fluorocarbon or uh, monofilament to save money. And that way it doesn't really matter that much. But you're casting with your blade, braid on like a traditional Texas rig or any other bait is not as far as throwing uh, fluorocarbon or monofilament. Yeah, it, 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 it really comes with a lot of experience, too, because we've been fishing. Well, it, before we got into the bass fishing world, we would just say, just don't braid, meter, done. Don't even talk about it, right? But now it's almost like, okay, so on a surf rod set up. Like, like one guy said, he was going to go keys on them all, right? Okay, so if you don't talk to us, you talk to just anybody else, let's say just throw a 50-pound uh, braid on there, it'll be fine. But if you talk to us, we, we, we've been through like the ringer a couple times, right? So if you want the maximum cast you can get, and that's that's the key thing about fishing downs. You want the you want the capability to stretch it if you have to, right? But if you're gonna stretch it, this is where line comes in critical. You can get an extra twenty yards just by downsizing your line, right? So you, the, the, the the difference between thirty pound and twenty pound braid is huge. You get twenty yards. The difference between twenty and fifty. Almost like 30 yards, 40 yards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it does play a, a role depending on what you're doing. Now, if you're on the bass side, it kind of goes preference again because, okay, so if you're a jig fisherman, if you're fishing clear lakes, you have to go forward carving. You have to downsize because, in my opinion, if, if, if a bait is in a fish's face for a long time, that's when like colors. That's when line clarity matters because he's he's staring at your bait and then he, he might be staring at your line too. But if your bait's moving real fast, like for example, we throw top lines with stripers, right? That thing is moving so fast, he's not even gonna notice there's a line tied to it. And he'll just smash it and then he's done. Same with our frogs, right? We tie 80 pound braid. I fish 80 pound braid in my frogs. And but I work my frogs real fast. He's not gonna notice is a line's up there and he'll come and just smash the frog, right? So it really depends on what you what you're doing. Uh, you know, once again, if you're if you know anything about chatterbaits, chatterbaits is another good example. If you're just hopping clean bottom, then by all means, floral carbon is probably the best, right? But if you got if you're ripping grass and there's a lot of grass, it's real thick. Braid, braid to a floral leader is the deal because you, it's a lot less effort to rip compared to floral carbon. Floral carbon, yeah, rip it so hard sometimes. And your, your arms are dead by the end of the day. But when I'm ready, you just hop it. Cuts the grass, cuts the grass, cuts the grass. So that's a little experience, you know, so just play with it. But if you're just new at it, don't even play it for floral carbon. Just start with that mono. Make sure you don't waste a lot of floral carbon. It's pretty expensive. So. Um, I have a few couple of questions, Cape Cod. First, do you need a fishing license? Yes, you need a fishing license. There is an ocean fishing license for Massachusetts. So go buy that. I think it's only like $15 or something like that. But it's only ocean water. It's not fresh water. And how did you guys travel with your fishing rods? Okay. So the traveling part is actually something that was really surprising to us. Uh, we traveled through American Airlines, and they charged us. 
Well, it's a rod tube. It's a big rod tube. It's an eight-foot rod tube, right? We were able to stuff three rods in there, three or four rods in there. And when we got to the airport, it was considered an extra extra large uh, baggage. So instead of being charged $40 for an extra bag, we were charged $60 for this thing. And that's how we were able to travel with it. And I really don't recommend it, pretty much. It kind of sucks. You can go there, buy and just bring your fishing reel. Yeah, buy a cheap surf. Rod. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, or ship your surf rod to somebody up there, or your Airbnb or something. Yeah, you rather just ship it. It'd be cheaper. You should just buy a brand new rod up there and just crazy sell it and free ship it back. Or or yeah. use it. Clean it. Yeah, yeah. give it to your cousin. <laughs> <or something. laughs> something. Yeah. Do we still um kayak bass fishing or just bass boat? No, we still um kayak bass fishing. We don't have a bass boat yet. Yeah, yeah, we uh we fish with our friends though. We have this thing called Bass Buddies. We haven't done it this year yet, but you know, a little dog boat, it does pretty good. We do beat the field of bass boats sometimes. <laughs> you know, we don't have a live one or anything, but you know, we just go out there for fun. We beat some of the guys up there. We have a good, good, good time. I was just talking about that. Um yeah, you know, we're 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 in the works. Like I said, as the channel grows, we'll bring on more equipment, boats, uh, boats, cameras, you know. Things like that, so uh, so definitely look out for that. Um, I'm trying to solve some property and get some funding for a boat. So once that goes through, we'll definitely get a boat. And I just bought a house. And we just he just bought a house. Yeah, so, so I'm kind of in the hole. Kind of in the hole for a little bit. Oh <laughs> yeah, man. So, anyways, um, what else questions they got? That's it. Yeah, we're, we're going on an hour already. Yeah. Dang. Well, y'all got any more questions? Shoot it this way. Yep. Oh, how do you should I get in the get, oh kayak bass fishing? That's a really good answer, actually. That, that's a whole that's a whole video series in itself, right? But primarily, get a kayak that, that, that that's designed for fishing. Okay, that's what I want to really stress because I don't want anybody falling off their kayaks. And, Losing all their fishing gear and, and that, that type of it's a nightmare, basically, is what it boils down to. Because you could losing your fishing gear ain't, ain't much, but you can think about it, you can lose your wallet, you can lose, you know, well, well, we carry guns, so you can lose your pistol. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty expensive. That's like four, five hundred dollars sometimes, a thousand dollars or something like that. Okay, so you want to be, you want to go on the water and get off the water safe. Okay, that's what I want to stress a lot, but primarily. Uh, Kayak is blowing up, man. It's like it's everywhere. There's everything from like your, your 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 club level, which is just like it might just be a one lake all the time, or it could be like a traveling circuit, a traveling tour, right? So right now we fish two tours, pretty much. Uh, we fish the Oklahoma Kayak Anglers, which is I I I believe is a top tier uh, circuit of kayak anglers in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, the guys that fish with us and that do well, that qualify for the national championships, they go to the nationals and they do well as well. So that kind of tells you the caliber of it. But that might be kind of uh, over the top for some guys. So if you're one of those guys that's like, I just want to get started, how do you get into the world? We also fish the Tuesday nights. I call it Tuesday nights, but it's actually called the Tulsa Bassathon. Yeah, it's a jackpot. But they do keep scores, so there's an angle of the year at the end, right? But you go out, it's two hours of fishing, and for the most part, you know, that's the major thing, too. It's a two-hour tournament versus a full-blown eight hours, and you're traveling three eight hours to get to certain lakes you've never been to. Uh, so, so Tuesday nights, it's really simple. Most of the lakes you've already been to, most lakes are pretty close to town. Uh, they're usually, what, 15 to 30-minute drive? Yeah, up and, to 45 minutes. Right, and then it's real laid back. We talk a lot of shit when we get there. A lot of joking around, not very serious kind of environment. A very welcoming environment, a very uh, laid, back. laid back. We'll teach you anything you know type of environment. Or if you go to the big tournaments, they're all kind of like, hush, hush, I found something, you tell nobody, you know? And they don't show you lures, they don't show you anything, right? Well, on Tuesday nights, you get there, there's like lures, there's line everywhere, you know? It's like, what do you want to know? Just, just check out my guy. You know, no, no issues, go ahead and check it out. Take your first spin, you know? <laughs> it's no big deal. So, unless, so if you're starting, get a kayak, and then just uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the bait shops they'll have this information too about what's available. So our cousin uh, Jay Hearn, that just moved here from Fresno, he used to work in a shop in I think is it Clovis? 
Rod yeah, and guns it's and Rod and Guns, and they they have the scoop on like kayak tournaments and everything like that. So you go into a shop like that, mom and pop shop, and just ask him, you know, where's what do I do? Where's who's the local guy guy I need to talk to? But and also, there's a lot of Facebook groups. Yeah, like, uh, maybe um search your area for a Facebook group, like whatever state you're in or that area, and just type in on Facebook, like like uh-huh. for example, here is like Tulsa kayaks, and then. It'll pop up and then it'll link you to other kayak groups and that's how you get your like feet in the water yeah, with yeah. the groups. So I mean there's guys on there that they if you don't want to go out by yourself or first time going out by, by yourself, you'd be like, hey, uh where, where is people fishing this weekend? First time out, I just want to get on the lake. Yep. And there's people will invite you to where, hey, we're going down this river, you know, you could tag along or Hey, a couple of buddies, we're going to this lake. If you want to come by, you can just come by this lake. We'll be out there. So, you know, you have other kayak guys out there that are looking out for you, too. Uh-huh. So, uh-huh. And then usually the kayak crowd is pretty it's pretty laid back. Even almost to the top tier level, it's still pretty laid back. You ask questions, and they'll give you answers. There's not a lot of what we, they call dog talk, where they purposely mislead you somewhere else, you know? So, the kayak crew, the kayak crew, especially the local level, it's pretty good. But don't you know, uh, just go in with an open mind, ask a bunch of questions, as many questions as you can. Uh, and then you, you'll, know, sooner or later, you're going to get to like official rules of a tournament. And official rules of a tournament, basically, almost across the board, there's going to be an official like ruler of some kind. Okay. And you have to go by that ruler. No ads, if or buts about it. That's how they keep the measuring stick. I guess to regulate, to like, regulate everybody. Cheating. Yeah, <laughs> it's cheating. So uh, the most popular one is a hog trough right now. But that's kind of yeah. going on downhill Yeah, because yeah. you can bend it. It's kind of, I don't know. That's a discussion the other day. Uh, very controversial. Uh, there's another one called the fish stick. There's another one called the catch board. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, and life jacket. Get a life jacket. And a 360 yeah, light. 360 light if you're pushing deep. Uh, Bryce says John Boat or Kayak. Okay, so that's a pretty good question. Okay, so if I'm chasing a personal best, I'm going on a kayak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I'm chasing a personal best, that's the kayak. Nice. The kayak, if you turn off the fish finder and the wind blows you, oh my gosh. You, just you catch <laughs> fish. I'm talking big fish, five, six pounders under your kayak in like two foot of water. You, you will catch them. Yeah. That's how crazy it is. On the kayak. Like when you drift in clear water, you'll see yeah. carp around you and they won't be spinning. Yeah. If you're just sitting, they don't even run off until yeah. you stand. If you're standing, then they run off because they think you're like a egret or yeah. some but I can't I can't do that in a boat. Even though I have a little 14-foot John boat, and even if my trolling motor is on super low, as soon as you tap that trolling motor, you just – all fish is scattered. Right. So, like, if you're trying to think about it, kind of like hunting too, right? If you're gonna chase a big buck, you want to be as healthy as you can. You want that element of surprise on your side every time. So, if you're gonna have to like John Boat or kayak, I'm a kayak guy, man. I'm chasing big bass. Now, if you're just saying we're just gonna go have fun, then John Boat, John Boat <laughs> all day. Yes, yeah. we we take the John our John yeah. boats still go. I think this year our John Boat weight went out a lot. Yeah, because yeah. when we went fun fishing, we're like we're, we're too lazy. Too lazy to pedal. So yeah. we just take the jumbo because you're like, get there, fish, fish, nothing, ee, to the next spot, you know? Yep. So, cool. yeah. Fun fishing. Yeah. And open water, open water fishing, if you're offshore graphing, it is easier on a boat too because uh, I think on the kayak, it kind of is, you know, from a kayak perspective, you kind of want to fish the bait. In the boat, you can do everything you want. Does color of your kayak affect fishing? No, it doesn't. The color of the kayak, see, the Hobie started like off with ocean fishing, like yeah. offshore fishing. So, yeah. like yeah. the the bright color, like your yellow, your blue, your red, those are for ocean fishing. So, like you don't get hit by a great white. Because if you're like in an olive green like us or a dune color, yeah. there's been um, shark bites. It's going to be mistaken for a sea one. Yeah. So, <laughs> those bright colors. To protect you from like shark bites and stuff, but yeah, kayak color doesn't matter in salt water. I mean, fresh yeah, water. We have so many people fishing yellow kayaks, red kayaks, mm-hmm. blue kayaks, 
Rainbow kayaks. Even our orange kayaks. Yeah, our orange kayak kept us in too. So I was like, I think it's more of a, I think it's more of a thing that's in your head. That's what I personally think. I mean, you think about it, you have a, even if you have a camouflage kayak, which is very popular, right? You have the Hobies that have like some swirls going. Mm -hmm. We got like, uh, was it Feel Free? Feel Free is pretty popular for this. They do like, I don't know what they do, but it's like you take a bunch of colors and you put it in a grinder and you grind it up. That's that's their color, right? And I don't think I don't think it really matters, to be honest. Yeah. It, like I said, it really only matters in the ocean so you don't get hit by a shark or a whale or something. And the brighter the color, it helps you on the water so people can see you. Like boat boaters will see you better too if you have a bright kayak. Yeah. So what's y'all's surf rod set up for the dam? Ben, okay, so you ready for this? <laughs> you asked, so we'll tell you. But <sighs> okay, so for, for me, I have a I have a eleven foot Daiwa ballistic surf rod. I didn't. I bought like an older older generation. And I didn't like the guides on it, so I re it myself to American guides. And then I have a Shimano Aerotechnium. Okay, it's one of those reels that's huge, it's got long neck, and I have it spooled currently with thirty pound. 30 pound max quattro, which is a super expensive line, but it, it it bombs things like there's no tomorrow. So that's my that's my down to that's currently what I'm doing. Do you even still fish yours? No, but my setup is still almost the same. Mine is a 13.3 uh, footer uh, Daiwa ballistic. Um, was it Sotega ballistic? It's a Sotega yeah, ballistic. so it's like the top it's model top tier. and that's yeah. for. Um, the tournament guys that they do tournament casting, you know, that exactly. you see them do that crazy 360. Yeah. But it, it casts as large just like a charm. And then my reel is a uh, 7,000 uh, Daiwa Bazier. Bazier. Yeah, Bazier, which is like a $700 reel. It's built for surf fishing too. Yeah. So it's a surf fishing reel on a yeah. like tournament casting rod. Yeah. Competition, and, yeah, competition. Uh, and then the line running is a, just a regular thirty pound power pro super slick. Right, and then the forty seven is not here, but I'll tell his setup. Okay, his setup is a. You guys see it's a lot on his on his the videos where there's a lot of damn fishing, and you see forty seven just smoking them. Forty seven throws a ten foot six TFO rod, but he has it paired with a Daiwa Saltega reel. It's a seven hundred dollar reel, by far the most expensive reel we have. Okay. And he's got a 20 pound max quadro. And he, he gets out there. Because that rod just matches him very well. So he's able to get his maximum potential every time. So his 10 6 is. Yeah, his 10 6 is touching 11 footers and 12 footers, the casting distance. All right. Would you put a trolling motor on the kayak? Okay, so that's that's like the most controversial thing in the kayak world, like to ever hit the kayak world, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like, okay, so there's like kayaks you can buy that are cheaper, from like thousand to fifteen hundred. They don't come with a drive system, so you're tempted to put a tow motor on it. But for the kayaks that are over fifteen hundred dollars, they come with a, a pedal drive, and there is a big advantage, in my opinion, pedal drive versus traditional hand pedals, right? So depending on which Lake you're doing, or what you're trying to do. Uh, we have run kayaks in the past. You know, when we went to, we we qualified for the national championship in Tennessee. We had trolling motors on our kayaks. That lake is huge. That lake we fished uh, Kentucky Lake. And that lake stretches two states. Okay, so if you're gonna even have a chance at this, at least even during practice, you have to. You have to fish a lot of good water or just try to find some water. And there's no way you're pedaling five miles every day and still be fresh for tournament day. So we, we actually had trolling motors on there. But but here's the here's kind of the caveat though. Once again, the other guy that asked me about the trolling motor, well, the, the drop boat versus kayak. And I told you if I'm chasing big fish, I'm in a kayak. Because the drop boat, the trolling motor gives off that sound. The fish know that sound. Well, I feel the same way when you put a trolling motor on the kayak. If you're using it to get to a spot, thumbs up, okay? Once you get there and you start pedaling, thumbs up, okay? But if you're there and you're using the, the trolling motor like you would on a boat, then I say thumbs down at that point. Because I think you scare the fish away. You're run, running into that problem with the boat again. 
So using it to cross a leg, get to your spot, and then turn the trolling motor off and go back to traditional battling, oh, yeah, big time. If you're trolling for stripers, oh, yeah, big time. My brother-in-law does it all the time. He trolls on a kayak mm-hmm. with a trolling motor with, like, a bunch of air uh, uh, umbrella rings off the back. Wax them all the time. It's like, okay, it works, you know? So depends on what you do. But if you're asking me for bass fishing, if you're fishing, uh, with the, say, say within two miles of your launch site, no trolling motor. If you're going to go beyond that, then you have to have a trolling motor, in my opinion. Where is the next yak tournament in Oklahoma? Uh, uh, every Tuesday, we have that little Tuesday night bass pond jackpot. But our next one is on Birch, and I think it's July 15th. Right. So there's oh, second week of July. Second weekend of July. July it was July 17th? Something like that. Yeah. 15 or 17. That's the, that's the Oklahoma kayak anglers. That, that's the big one that comes around the state. So there's that one we're going to. It's not too far from where else. We're definitely going that one. There's one this weekend on Arcadia for the OKC guys. Yeah, yeah the, so. the jackpots. And then we have our, our next jackpot on Tuesday. And, uh, oh, come by for that. If you're, if you're in the Venita area, come by for that. Uh, because the uh, William – look up his name and go friend request him. His name is William William yes. Vest, like V-E-S-T. And friend request him. He's the tournament director of the uh, Tulsa Bassathon – him, John Fennell, which is the mayor of Venita, mm-hmm. right? John Fennell is the mayor of Venita, and they had a pretty cool idea that uh, we, we go fish his lake. It's called Bull Lake. It's it's a lake that's been shut down in private for a while, but it's just recently opened in the last two years. Uh, we're, they're throwing a Tuesday night tournament up there. Once again, it's a jackpot. Best three fish takes like 80% of the field. It's money, and they pay big bass. But come out to that event, and like I said, you'll, you'll definitely see us up there. Uh, unless something crazy happens, but we're doing the kind of potluck. So come by, hang out, get some food. John Fiddle's wife is cooking something for us. Uh, hot dogs and burgers. Yeah, hot dogs and burgers. Yeah, free. Come on out. Uh, we're doing that. Uh, I'm bringing like plates and soda and chips. So come on, come on. I bring some beer. <laughs> oh, wonder if we can bring beer out there. Nah, oh, yeah, soda. Yeah, yeah, soda, probably soda and water. Yeah, they think they do have an alcoholic pro- 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 prohibition type thing going. It is a state. It doesn't see park. She's between Daiwa and Shimano. Yeah, Maxio, you can't really um, do that maintenance yourself. But yeah, but Maxio's crazy though. My certate, I've had it for three years. I've dumped it in water so many times, and that Maxio, man, I swear by it, it feels brand new still. I pulled some big fish on that too, and it's still freaking smooth. Like if it was a Shimano, I would think it would have been twice right. Just being honest, you know. So that's that's the Daiwa advantage, you can say. Are you ordering an umbrella rig or a rig? There's a difference. All right. If your tournament allows a trolling umbrella rig, the more the baits, the better. Oh, I'm gonna do that video too. I take three or four umbrella rigs and tie them all together. I have like sixty baits. And I'll drop it down in the water and see what happens. Yeah, but you gotta go with. Your state re- regulation too, because some states only allow certain hooks. Yeah, it's sort of now. Yeah, yeah, so like even if you, you can have like a thousand bait on there, but you can only have three hooks, so you gotta go with your state regulation. So you gotta look that up. Yeah, it could it could differ from like lake to lake too. You know. <clears throat> okay, what's up? Ken Browns from Northwest Arkansas. Oh, Ben Dover, thirteen three. Damn, two piece. No, that's actually oh, three piece, right? Yeah. You're right. Yeah, my, my yeah, piece is a piece three piece. Rod. Yeah, three piece. Two piece, two six and a half footer. That's pretty, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's a three piece rod. Uh, if I was to choose, I'll choose a Stell over a Dow. I just like the Dow because of the Maxia. There is really no way to service it. Yeah, there's really no way to service it. Because we even asked the, uh, was it the product manager mm-hmm. that one time? Uh, yeah, we, we uh, were, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the classic. classic. The, the dial guys were at the classic, and we asked him, Can I just service it myself? And then he was like, You shouldn't have to service it. And if you do, send it in, we'll service it for you. You know, so I was like, Oh, that's kind of iffy. But then I've had one, and I, I didn't even have to service it yet. It's been like three years, so I don't know, give or take, you know. Have we ever fished that low dam? Um, you're talking about the low water dam on top of Fort Gibson between um, the Hudson Dam and Gibson. We haven't really fished it because usually when you go there, you'll fish for sand bass or hybrid. Yeah. 
And then we usually just rather just go around here, which is like Ugo. And then, we, but we fished up at Cal, uh, Kerr Dam, but not really down at the Low Water Dam. No. Unless you're saying Cal, uh, Kerr Dam. Ooh, Kerr Dam is a different story. It's too bright. It's okay. I mean, it's, it's too dark. That's, it's a little bit of lightness, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you ever fished at Lower Dam? Yeah, multiple places. How many rods do you usually take in a kayak bass tournament? Catch pre spawn and oh, post. You didn't hit. All right. Um, I take an average of eight, and some days if I'm really pushing it, ten. But that's the day I'm like, oh, I'm gonna rig up this drop shot rod, and I'm not gonna retie the rod at all all day. Well, I'm not gonna waste my time tying or rigging up the rod. Yeah, I bring that special rod and I put it all the way at the bottom. Yeah, I don't touch it unless I really have to. And then, I mean, most of the time it's eight. And our kayak, we rigged it up to it. It holds eight really comfortably. Yeah, but, so, so let me break that down for me. So I carry eight. That's my comfort number, okay? For some reason, if I carry six, I feel like I'm not very prepared. I don't know why, right? So I carry eight. Now, this is why, and if you want to break it down one layer more, this is what I need. I have, when you, well, before we go to the lake, we do a little bit of study. Like, what, what should be going on? You know, pre spawn, spawn, post spawn, winter, summer, whatever, right? And you have, this is what I would do. I have eight rods. I try to keep it eight sometimes in the night. I've even gone 12 one time. That was, that was a disaster, right? Because once you, I feel like once you go beyond eight, you're just confused. You don't know what the heck's going on. You don't have a game. So if you if I in the ideal condition I have eight and this is my eight right you have eight of the eight you have two specialty rods that may or may not play that day this is for tournaments I'll break this down in the video too for example we're going to a lake that might might offer a punching bite so right a punching bite right but you know you know that those are so rare like a punching bite right there it's so rare like. Go to like, like for example, the, the tournament we just had. I had a punch set up, rigged up, but I didn't even use it that day, right? But it's on a one and a half ounce slither rig with a five ounce hook going. But well, everybody knows if you're punching, you're gonna if you get a bite, it's a big fish, right? And it's probably gonna win you good money too. But it'll probably never happen that day. So if I take that, like I said, I, I slide it in the lowest spot, like you said, lowest spot. And once again, I also take a Something else that's kind of specialty. So for me, it's like you typically this time of year, the post ball time of year, either I'm punching I have my two specialty rods, a punching setup, and a deep diver setup, like my seven foot eleven rod, big old crankbait on it. But I know I might not use it that day, right? But if I find that bite, oh man, we're in the money for sure, right? But so you have to carry those in case the opportunity presents itself, right? So those are the two specialty rods. That so I got six left, right? Of the six, it's going to really depend on where lake we're going. Okay, so if we're going to a grass lake, two chatterbaits. One on braid, one on foregard. Right off the bat, two chatterbaits, I'm going to frog rod, and I'll have some type of uh, top water, like, you know, like, you need to like, a little, uh, what's going on? Torpedo. A torpedo, yeah. <laughs> Something like that, you know? And then I'll throw like a rattle trap, and I'll have a, a 10 inch worm, or a foot bubble worm also. So that kind of makes them a five and a six. And I also, of the six rods, I want to throw a finesse one in there too. I'm a power fisherman, but I understand finesse can get you lucky bites. So like for, for example, the past uh, Saturday, right? I had two chatter baits. I had a square bill. I had a 10 inch worm and I had a shaky head and had a quarter ounce rattle trap. Those were my six, right? That I know going in, those should be players. But I have the other two stowed away just in case. And if I bring those two out, and if I get bit on it, you know we're in the top five. But those are rare. But, but they, they have happened before during tournaments. They have happened before. Yeah, like this year, um, I've been carrying my swim bait rod with me. I always carry my swim bait rod. But I usually just throw like medium-sized swim baits on it, or I even throw Texas rig on it. Because, you know, on a kayak, you're limited to all the gear you can. So your one rod, you got to do multiple techniques. But this year I caught um, two glide fish on um, glide baits during the tournament. Uh, one's a 20 inch smallmouth, the other's a 20 inch largemouth. But like 
some techniques like that, you, I mean, I even use that swim bait rod to throw A rigs too. So I have one of the rods, my, my swim bait rod covered majority of like three or four techniques. I have a big top water rod, which is my frog rod. I use that for buzz baiting and for frog and big uh, walking bait, like a spook or um, a leggy craft gunfish or something like that. Yep. And then I carry one for strictly Texas rig, like I mean, with 20 pound line on there for like brush pile or big rocks and stuff okay. that if you catch the fish or you hook the fish, you don't want to break off. And that's the, that's the money rod. Uh, you have one that's like, kind of like multi-purpose. You can throw like square bill. You could throw like small swim baits. Mm -hmm. You could throw a variety of lures on that more multi-purpose rod. And then I usually carry two spinning rods. I like to throw my singles on spinning. So I throw singles on spinnings and flukes on spinnings. And then I have a shaky head rod that's always tied up. Mm -hmm. And my shaky head rod, I use the same shaky head for net rig. So I'll just cut a Cinco and throw it around to that shaky head and then throw it as an air rig. So, um, and you know, I could throw top water with those spinning, uh, spinning rods and it covers a bunch, but, and then like some days you're, you're switching out. But usually um, I usually milk that area before I go. Yeah. So I'll throw my big worm, throw my jig and then I'll throw a shaky head after that. Or even sometimes I chase the shaky head with a net rig. So I mean, I, chase myself with different baits and then like throw a finesse swim bait before I leave and stuff like that. So oh yeah clean up your spot for you. He's really good at that. I'm not talking about that. You yeah, don't no fish after me. Yeah. You can usually, fish out for me. Usually when I leave there's no fish there. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. You know? Uh do you guys use depth finders? Tim Brown all the time, Tim. All the time. Okay, so I'd rather lose I said, I, just to give you some perspective, because it kind of feels like you don't, you're not in the electronics game just yet, right? So, springtime, the the electronics, I think spring and fall, the electronics doesn't play let's as start, big. Let's start with winter. Oh, okay, winter, electronics, hundred percent. Most of the times you're fishing deep, right? So you got to go find those offshore brush piles or offshore rock piles. It it's not going to be less than 10 feet. Okay? It's going to be like 15, 20. So you have to have another set of eyes, right? Because that's what you got to look at. Like, electronics is another set of eyes. If that rock was on the bank, everybody can see it, right? But now it's not. It's, it's 20 feet of water. So you have to go find it. A lot of times, yeah, when or not, it's fish deep. You know, find the rock piles. Sometimes you can find them suspended, especially with stripers and everything. They're even deeper. They're, they might be in open water. They might be in like, Oh, they might be like 100 yards offshore, just hanging out in the middle of the water. You have to have an electronic to find them. If you're a striper, white bass, that class of fish, uh, catching on a boat, I would rather lose all my fishing poles and just have one and have that fish finder. Okay? Give you an example of how important that fish finder is, is for human service species. Uh, for spring, they'll be pushing up for spawn. So if you're fishing like a striper or hybrid yeah. or some sort of schooling fish, they'll staging up to move up river to spawn or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you could locate them with your like your your depth finder, your side imaging and stuff. Uh, for bass, they're they're pre they're when they pre spawn they suspend, and you could target them with uh, like a light school or panoptics. That's yeah. even like some other some other day we'll probably answer that. Yeah. We don't That's have that a question for the day. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, yeah. They're staging up, they're moving shallow. So once the fish are up spawning, you don't use it as much. You're mm -hmm. using your eyes more than you your fish finders. Yeah. So if I'm fishing shallower than five feet, I turn my units off. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the only time I turn it on is really to check water temp. Mm -hmm. uh, water temperature matters a lot. Um, and sometimes you like you here's another tip too. Like if you're fishing for bass, if you if you if you get to an area. And this is probably the only time I'll use a fish finder, right? You get to an area, you see a bunch of beds, right? But they're all kind of you know, spread out. You you go right over them. And this is this is only true if you have a really good external GPS. You could you could waypoint every single bed. Okay? You could waypoint it. So so say say you got there and one to go, which is the only time you'll see a fish. One to go, right? You waypoint where is that? This is a major nugget too. I don't know why I'm getting this one. Waypoint where they're at, go away. 
Just, 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 just leave the area. Give There's just fishing on the bank. Yeah, keep fishing like you never saw that bench. Fifteen minutes later, bust a U-turn, come back, look at that waypoint. There's a casting ring you can put on that waypoint, right? Say it's like a thirty-foot casting ring, and that's how far your single could throw, right? Maximum gas. Come up to that ring, bomb that single right to that uh, waypoint. It's magic sometimes, man. Like they, they just eat it. Yeah. They know you're there, you know, and you know exactly where the bed's at. Post spawn is pretty much around the spawn, so it's like that, and it's going post spawn. You could probably work that into summer. So yeah, like summer post fishing. Summer, post spawn, yeah. yeah, it's like summer fishing. You have to like go offshore most of the time. It's one offshore. Yeah, lot, so you have to go. Offshore. So most summer tournaments are one on like rock piles or like fresh piles. So you have to find those on grass good edge too. Yeah, strong grass edges and um, fish those. Good, like deep structure stuff, stuff you can't see with your eyes. Yeah. You know, so, so, you have to, and then of course, fall fishing is still everything goes yeah. fish is from the bottom of the lake to the top of the lake. So, anything goes. Um, it's kind of like spring fishing again. I, I'm just a lot faster. I, the way I think yeah. it is, spring and fall is almost the same, and winter and summer is almost the same because that's where they live. Yeah. yeah, so the fish move up and down, and the, the fall, the fish feeds up too. Yeah. So, it's just like summer, but they hit better top water. <laughs> yeah, so do you use fish finders and depth finders? Like, yes, all yeah, all the time. Uh, there's a lot, there's actually a lot of good things about it, and that I don't think everybody understands because a fish finder has multiple uses, uh, especially the ones with GPS and everything. But GPS, uh, especially even, even if you're not using for, for trying to find fish, uh, a fish finder can help you make decisions on where to start to fish. Okay, a great example is this, uh, my, my fishing video that takes on we smashed them on stripers, right? So before I even got to Texola, I brought up my fish finder and I have a map card in it. And I have the map card, I basically said, hmm, stripers should be done spawning right now. They should be on offshore points. And I'm looking at points that are anywhere between 15 and 35 per beat. So I just straight up highlight that lake. And I know where we're we staying too, so I'm trying to find an area that's kind of close to it. And then there's a big creek arm that comes up to the left. And I'm just like, okay, I should check this spot, this spot, this spot, and this spot. I have four other boats with me. So I said, you guys will check this spot, this spot, and this spot. And it was a successful day. Okay. Haven't been on that lake in about two years. Not really targeting stripers. Not even targeting stripers. Yeah. And go in first time. We figured them out. Like I saw I saw the mega school day one. They weren't they weren't biting, right? But we were there for three days. So I kept checking on them, checked on them again. On the third night and we'll leave the next morning. They started biting for some miraculous reason. You're calling a whole bunch of strikers. So we'll check out that video too. You guys have it. It's called, I think it's just simply called Chicks Home and Strikers. Yeah, DS Moto said that when is a certain situation or place when flukes on jig heads work better than top water? Uh, when the water is cold yeah. and the fish are not hitting top water, yeah, you flukes on jig heads are better. Uh, dam fishing when they're running water. Um, sometimes that wave in that water current, the, the fish can't see that top water as good as if, if you're throwing a fluke on a jig head. So, and of course, if you're fishing bottom or the fish relating to the bottom, then you yeah. have to fish a yeah. So jig. sometimes, sometimes like, you know, you, the fish just won't come up to the surface and it, it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. So for stripers, it's primarily if it's nice and sunny out without a single cloud, we call it bluebird days. It's hard to get a top water bite, but they might be on fire with a fluke. So you just have to, you know, you have to pick and choose. Um, if the water is really shallow, if it's less than five feet, then probably the top water work all day. But if the water is deeper than that, water is running, things like that, you know, you imagine the top water in a river system and when the river is running, there's a lot of disturbances on the surface where I think if the fish is not paying attention, they might miss the top water all together. But if, the, if they're willing to buy top water, top water all day, man. It's like it's it's the best show you'll ever yeah, see. It's visual too, so you can yeah. see when they get your bait. Yeah, and you can see how big the fish are when they hit. And it's straight fun. That's what got us so addicted to fishing with the top water fishing. And you know where they're at. You can see it. <laughs> you can see them too. And it's plus with their busting Chad cast out there, so you the more hits and <sighs> Yeah, I love that. Uh, um, what types of frog do you like using Using pad frogs, popping frogs, and paddle frogs, frogs, and what color? David Chang. That's a good question. So, uh, when we started frog fishing, we used spros and uh, 
Striking. Okay. Striking, yeah, for the most part. But I've evolved a little bit beyond that now. So I've, I've started uh, with, if it's like a walking frog, I still like the Spros. I still like them. And if it's a popping frog, I like the Terminator. Oh, it's really good. Look at ratios, like extremely good. Okay, but I have to modify it. That's like that's the that's the part. There's nothing going on here for you guys asking all your gay questions. Okay, and plus it's this video number one. Jeez, we're gonna let the beans out. Later videos, maybe not. Right, but basically, like everybody knows, a frog unmodified, you're gonna miss nine out of ten bites. Remember that? Well, oh, fifty fifty. Right. Well, if you got the right rod setups too, then yeah. But if you got like a traditional rod with you know like 15 pound fluorocarbon, you're gonna miss a lot. Yeah. So for frog fishing, let's let's just talk gear first, right? You need a stout rod, like almost broomstick, and you have to throw on braid. No ands, ifs about it. 65 pound braid at a minimum. That's what I think. I throw 80. Okay. So uh, Spro, when you buy the frogs, I think you have to, you know, that the, 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 the hooks are kind of bent in a little bit. You have to grab a pair of pliers and bend both hooks up and a little out. It helps with hookup ratio. Uh, but then you trim the leg down, and then it works pretty good. Uh, in terms of colors, uh, we primarily throw white and yellow. We have black ones too, but typically you don't throw black. Uh, white, in my opinion, you will get the most amount of bites. I'm I'm talking solid white, okay? I'm not even talking like speckled bronze or something like that. Solid white. And when it comes to the yellow, the more yellow it is, the better it is. That's my opinion. If you need to break it up, take a take a Sharpie and just draw some lines, like some tiny lines on the sides. That's it. So the reason behind it, right? So why yellow and why white? White is a universal bait, bait fish color. You know, it can be mistaken for bluegill. It can be mistaken for shad. It can be mistaken for shiners. I mean, just keep going, right? Now, the yellow, not a lot of people talk about this, and this is kind of like just, just us, you know? Yellow, to me, signifies bluegill, okay? Bluegills. Big bass eat bluegill. Small bass have a hard time eating bluegills. I don't think they even try, okay? So, so if you're going after big bass, throw yellow. You get less bites. You get better quality bites. That's that means it's right for you. And the, the popping frog, uh, I know Spro makes a popping frog. I don't like it. It's too small. The hooks just so it's small. Three, yeah. yeah, it's a three out hook. Uh, I think Booyah makes one. I don't like it. Also, it's just it's something's not right. The Terminator frog. I know it's hard to get. Most shops don't even carry it. But my hookup ratio on that. Okay, so the Terminator frog. When you buy it, the hook kind of sucks. I'll be honest, right? If you change that hook out to a Gamagatsu EWG rock, my gosh, the hookup ratio is almost 100%. And you don't even have to bend the hooks out. You just you can stop. Yeah. Anyway, that's my, that's my favorite folks. Uh, mine has been a uh, spit and chad. I said, I said it in a couple of other yeah. videos too. But uh, it's like the – it's like a shad – the other shad one with not a popping one. But this one, it just has a little cup on it, and so it just kind of spits the water a little bit. It doesn't pop the water, it spits the water. Yeah, so uh, if you have a little more wind, you just throw that. And like the, the red ear color is the one you go. It's like yellow bottom. It has some lines, and it's supposed to implement a bluegill. Yeah, bluegill. bluegill. But then, yeah, I throw that, and then mainly a white or a natural color, sometimes black, but it just depends on the day. Um, just go with the most confident color you got, or if you don't know, then throw white because white you usually get a big bite. Uh, and then if you don't get a big bite on white, then switch to black. Go totally different opposite color. Yeah. yeah. So if you're if what in doubt, just throw yellow. white <laughs> or yellow. If you want a big bite, I throw white. Yeah. See how our opinion is different so much. Yeah, it's it's up to the the fisherman. Yeah. How do you guys fish dingy water? What lures do you guys fish? Okay. Works best for hybrids and striper. Oh, hybrids yeah. and Yeah. 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 A-ring again. <laughs> I can't go wrong with A-rings. <laughs> uh, I'm telling you, A-ring or bell ring, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's expensive. Don't get me wrong. It's expensive uh, to buy because you're investing. A traditional A-ring, fully rig, you're like for 20 bucks. You know? An umbrella rig, fully rig, it's like 50. Okay, so... But if you're, if, it depends on what you want to do, right? If you're, if you're fishing for fun, then I don't recommend you to do it. 
because in my opinion, it just seems like it's not very fun to reel in like something that's really heavy that doesn't even run, you know? So it's like, okay, it's kind of stupid. But if you're one of those guys, it's like, look, I, I, I'm wasting like ten dollars in gas already. I want a limit, you know. I'm, I got family thing, you know. Whatever your reasons are, if you if you're trying to harvest, right? Umbrella rig, man. Yeah? Umbrella rig on a boat crawling around. It's stupid. But if you're on a shore, it's not really the lower. It might be the color. So we ran into a situation when sharpers are hitting pink, and nobody throws pink. So throw pink. Or Thank throw, God. Or throw. <laughs> or, or throw uh, all shark trees. Mm-hmm. Something different, like from the norm that I'm throwing. So yeah, sometimes not even it's not even the bait. It's just the color. So switch colors. Yep. Freaking TikTok. Somebody called a striper on like uh, pink swimming. I was like, man, what the heck? And they said it mimics uh, squid. When do you throw a popping frog and when do you like to throw a walking frog? Oh, I actually figured that out this year, right? So I let the wind tell me. Okay, so if you look at a frog, same, same they're both white, same color, same type, everything, right? You let the wind tell you what to do. Okay, so and also how how you how you plan the fishing. So so if you, if you see a stump over there. You, you think your bite's gonna come off that stump? Put on pumping frog. Because you're not you're not gonna work it all the way back in the boat. You're just trying to walk it. Like, ch- 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 hopefully, boom, it's done. You know? Well, walking like a, a traditional walking frog is more like a cover water type of frog. You know, like, you have a flats, yeah, like flats, yeah, flats, pads, grass. Throw it out there, bring it back. And then also, this is where I think uh, if you're trying to cover water, you can cover water with pumping frog too. But if it's windy, you need a little bit more sound, right? So you throw a popping frog. But if it's dead calm, you throw a popping frog, you probably won't get by. It, yeah. it's, it's very unnatural. You know, especially for me, I walk it real fast too. So it's just like, <laughs> it's not, it just doesn't work. That's when you want to throw a traditional frog and kind of walks. And you and every time you walk it, it's very, it's, a, it's, like, a, it's like a scoop. Just like, yeah, and um, the walking, the walking frog is better in like, Heavy vegetation, yeah. your popping frog will get hung up more, yeah. and you'll fight the frog more. Yeah. So it's kind of like an arrowhead; it will just come through everything. Yeah. So that's when you switch. If you're more open water, popping, and then if you're heavy cover, like over pads, over yeah. in the lily pads, everything else, just throw the regular. Well, if you throw over like mush, then you want the straight head. It comes to it a lot yeah. faster. Uh, have we used the spit and shad by Spro? Yeah, that's the one I was talking about. The spit and shad is, uh, I think, is one of the better hooker ratio from Spro because yeah. the body of the the frog is like a keel, and then the hook sits on top of the, the yeah, well, two corners. So if you look at it, it's like a triangle, and the the hook sits on top. So if it if the bass hits it and it, you know, crushes anyways. Uh, the hook points are already there, and it will get them. So the hooker ratio on it is really good. I probably only lost like three fish so far on on that frog, and I've been throwing it for like two years. So really good frog. The only sucky part is um, they don't come in a bunch of colors, but they have enough colors. Yeah, they come in that yellow area. Come back. <laughs> what you guys? Um, do oh, you man. fish Keystone Dam for wipers on shore? Actually, Ooh. wipers are pretty rare at Keystone. Yeah. yeah. Dominated by the stripers and white bass. Yeah. Um, at Keystone, yeah, it really snaggy because of all that catfish fishermen, too. And the water is not that deep. When they're running current, it's really fast, and the water is only, like, maybe five to seven feet. Yeah. Well, yeah. Five to seven. Maybe, maybe, maybe ten. Not that deep. Maybe yeah. even ten. But it's fast water and shallow with a bunch of rocks in there. You're going to get hung up. Like a million Fishing lines on it. Too. And people come, you know. I mean, which, which fish finder is, well, which fish finder brand is best in your opinion, and why? Rance, Hummingbird, or Garmin? Yeah, don't forget about Ray Marine. They're in there too. Okay, so in my opinion, it's Hummingbird. Okay, so if you're not sponsored by nobody, Hummingbird. It is a little harder to use because they're the way the menu system is structured. The Hummerbird to me feels like the old school guys. They haven't caught on to the whole like iPhone interface yet. So their interface is a little trickier to get used to. 
but it's a learning curve thing. Once you get over that learning curve, I feel that the technology that's in the unit, it's a lot better. Uh, I know, I don't know if this is still true, but uh, a couple of years ago, Lawrence had like structure scan, right? A structure scan is basically side imaging from Hummingbird, but you had to buy all this, this special sensor and it was like a whole different like amplifier looking thing. And there was like four pieces. You have to, you know, Hummingbird does it all one. So, so that's a big plus for Hummingbird. And also, it seems like Hummingbird's always the first one to come up with all this cool technology. Hummingbird is the first one to do dial imaging, first one to do side imaging, first one to do a forward facing sonar. That's a 360. Now, Garmin has now grabbed a chunk of that with the pan optics. But now it's kind of getting to that preference type thing, you know? So, um, Sponsor. Yeah, if you're sponsored, <laughs> right, you run that stuff. We're not, so we, we we pick the ones that I feel are the best, and we run hummingbirds. And we've been running for like three years now, uh, four years, four years now. Ever, I mean, ever since we got the John boat, we've been running hummingbirds. And hummingbird has uh, Lake Master, which is yeah. Lake Master is a company Ooh. owned by hummingbird yeah. to map lakes for them. Yeah. So um, pretty much, you have more in-depth contour on yeah. lakes. Like they'll go out and scan that lake and write a map and then upload it to. So every year you get, only, yeah. yeah, every year you get uh, a new map and Lake Master is mainly only for Hummingbird. Yeah. So, only. so those little features actually will push you and pull you towards one of the uh, other yeah. or not. But in terms of user friendliness, Lorance. Lorance has got that game locked. Okay, so if you've never used the Fish Finder before, you jump off, you, you just go to basketball and just start punching buttons, right? You will like the Lorance better. I guarantee you will like the Lorance better. Lorance has all this cool touchscreen stuff, right? And it's cheap. Like, I think for 700 bucks, you're already into the touchscreen world. Where Humber, you gotta break the $2,000 mark to get to the touchscreen world. Okay, so if you're just gonna be like, oh man, I like the touch features, and da -da 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 -da, you're gonna end up buying a Humber. But the thing about it is, when it's you know at the store, you're touching it so cool. But when you get to the real world, I don't want a touchscreen. Because when you're bobbing up and down, right, when you're trying to touch something on the screen, you're going to miss like half the time. You, know, you want buttons. Yeah. So have you guys ever fished up north, uh, up and fished the Midwest, like South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin? And what's your thought of the difference compared to fishing in the South? Mm -hmm. um, That's a good question. Yeah. Those lakes up there are tend to be more clear, natural lakes. Natural so lakes they have grass. more grass yeah. and they have pike. <laughs> oh yeah, you know what? One year I came up to um uh, I came up to Minnesota one time with my sister and we went to we went to Fayman Lake and there was another was it Big Bear Lake? I fished that and then like a, a white bear lake or something like that. And I fished another lake and I got smoked by a muskie. I bought my frog as far as I could and it walked, walked it. I got smoked by musky, but I got tucked with all these like leaves, and then I lost it like halfway back. And all I saw in my frog was just like slashes. So I knew it was a big musky. I mean, just from the feel of it, it's probably like a 30, 35 inch musky. Yeah, you know? but the, the difference is your lakes are just a lot more clearer than ours because yeah. ours are like river bays um, that are dammed into lakes, and not our lakes are like crystal clear. Just like clear, we clear. say that it's clear when it's like five feet deep, and yeah. you can see, and it's stained. It's yeah. like really stained. So yeah, we say it, that. Yeah, clear. right. Because their their lakes, it's almost like bathtub clear, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like bathtub water clear. Yeah. Our lakes never get that clear. Like on, on, on the best case scenario, it's like ten, maybe. It's still like tea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like a ten in water. Yeah. It'd be like dark. Like you'll see the bank going down and then it just turns black or it just turns brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, um, but the difference yeah. is our lakes part has way more fish and their pressure because there's a lot of fishermen here and they, yeah. they chat. I mean, you got catfish fishermen, you got bass yeah, fishermen, fishermen, you got That's crappie right. fishermen. Uh, those fish up north, I feel like they're dumb because it's, it seems like not a bunch of the guys are fishing for them. At least not, not at least not for bass. Yeah. Maybe for walleyes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mass, it's a lot less pressure. I mean, there's some lakes that do get pressured, but really, like, they're not as pressured as down here. I mean, down here, you have three, four tournaments yes. a week. Like, for example, like Grand Lake, Grand Lake holds six tournaments a week. Yeah. 200 boat tournaments a yeah, week. Yeah, 200 boat tournaments. I mean, 200 boat per tournament and yeah. six, 
So Chairman it's over me. like a thousand boats go through that lake every month. Yeah, and it looks only like two and no, yeah, it's everything from square. like everything from like rookies to like top tier pros come through that lake. Yeah. So, so it's it's pressure. I mean, it's not some of the pressure most pressures lake in the country, but they're pressured. They're really pressured. Yeah, they're throwing their rigs. Yeah, so so my opinion on that is uh grass lakes, chatterbait. Uh, you might want to steal your because pikes might steal your jackhammer. I don't know how you guys are doing that. I mean, I don't. I'm, I say steal your, but I'll probably do like eighty pound fluorocarbon or something like that, uh, just to keep your jackhammers in. And then, uh, other than that, I think the speed. It's either you're gonna get them with speed or you're gonna get them with finesse. You know? And we we fish up in Massachusetts for bass when we were up there, so it's kind of like set up in Massachusetts. A lot of lily pound lakes, a lot of milfoil or hydraulic quintel lakes and tails. Yeah, so um. Frog, 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 frog. And like I said, the fish are done because up north we used to throw a six pound with a spider wire leader yeah. so we don't break our lures out. <laughs> so it's yeah. almost the same, um, but I don't think your fish is as pressured. Yeah. Your fish ain't as big too. Yeah. Well, smallmouth. You guys definitely got smallmouth. Oh, yeah. Mouth. Oh, man. That was years. Ridiculous. What time of the year will you catch the biggest trapper at the dam? Uh, uh, when they're up and spawning? Uh, usually uh, April or May if they're yeah. running here. You only have like a three day window to catch these yeah. fish. Though. Uh, I mean, you're, you're, like, you're gonna like see the little ones come through, and then the bigger ones. ones come through, and then there's gonna be like a million of them come through, and everybody smash them, and then you'll catch that three day window of the giants, and then it's just dead after that. If the, the giants are talking about are, I, the females, the big females, right? And it feels like those are the slowest fish to come up there. So they're like the last ones. So once they're dead, it's done all the time. And that's yeah, that's the spawn. Definitely the spawn. Uh Jared Lord, we don't um guide because you have to get your guiding license. You have to learn how to do CPR and buy that. Uh, was it? Like, do you have to be Coast Guard certified or something? <laughs> yeah, like that too. Something yeah, like that so. too. So we'll, we'll guide eventually. Usually we'll do it right now. Yeah, yeah. We're just too busy right now doing other stuff too. Eventually you will. Um, Simrad all the way. Simrad's good for my favorite for the marine world. So yeah, Simrad's pretty good. Uh, Simrad and Lawrence actually same company. Do you know that? Yeah, pretty much same company. Uh, shout out from Boston, from Don. Hey Don, Boston. We lived there for like ten years. Oh, we lived in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Yeah, <laughs> ten years up in New England. You guys know uh, big swim baits by any chance? Just curious. Uh, we've been trying to throw some big baits. Five five nine, huh? Uh, yeah. Um, some glides. I do some we S waivers. Too, but and you don't. Yeah, you we know, have huds, but yeah, you don't want to yeah. donate it to a guard. <laughs> yeah, we have too many fish here that will eat a freaking Huddleston, like two feet critters. You know, like you, the guys up north will understand. You throw a Huddleston in the north, freaking muskie will just chop the tail right off. You know? Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. not like California where you only have bass. It's right. Or stripers, yeah. but most of them are just largemouth and maybe spots, and maybe yeah. maybe where there will be some smallmouth. Yep. But your lakes only have mainly largemouth is the predominant like predator fish. Yeah, our lakes has hybrid striper, white bass, big yeah, old fish. They go three different kinds of catfish: catfish, <laughs> flatheads, <laughs> blue cat, channel alligator, gar. You have gars. Yeah, which basically is like an alligator's mouth. It seems like. Yeah, you got drum that are dumb that will eat everything. Um, you have a whole bunch of invasive species are carp that you could get hooked up on. Yeah. And there's fish everywhere. You can't just go to a point and just throw out a big swim bait and roll it back. Um, you go throw it at a point and there's a bunch of carp. You, you probably mark it on your down image and you think they're bass, but they're probably just carp or drum. Yeah. And there's a lot of fish in I mean, it, it, it works. Things. And then big baits here works. It's just uh, you go throw it for a couple like hours and you don't get bit, and you go throw shaky heads and you get bit. And plus, our water are not as clear to throw big swim baits. Right. So it's tough to throw big swim baits. Big swim baits, from what I understand, is more for rock lakes and rock deep lakes, right? So for for the most part, our our lakes we only have like two that are deep rock lakes. The majority of our other lakes are like I'll give you an example. You're not going to want to throw the huddles in, right? We have a lake that's 50% covered in timber. Yeah, you throw that thing in there, you're stuck for scouts. Break off $20, $30. So a lot of people will throw like a swim jig 
or to throw on something else. But maybe you put a big plastic on the back, you know, so that they imitate a big, big profile. Uh, but, but yeah, you know, we don't, we don't throw too much here. I do know they're just like private groups kind of deal that they, they do buy all of there, but it's like no one talks about it. Like they do out, out, out West where, oh yeah, this tournament was won on a puddle stick or a glide bait or something like that. If you look at this place, it's like most of our tournaments, especially the ones that we know of that are published, uh, majority of them, crankbaits, spinnerbaits, jigs, always the three oldest ones are still the three most dominant ones, you know? Uh, and chatterbait too, but, you know, for the most part, if you look at the, the finishes, if they do disclose what they're throwing, it's usually jigs, spinnerbaits, you know, traditional old school stuff. Uh, best floral card and brand do you use? We are big into Sunline. Sunline yeah. yeah, and we throw a lot of FC Sniper. But I have to throw in some shooter FC, uh, some shooter, man, they're, they're just the best, but they're expensive on the, the wallet. So only tournament day. Sometime if I know that, hey, I'm going to use 20 pound and it really comes down to 20 pounds to win this tournament. I'll order a pack of shooter just for that tournament. Yeah, so we get that question once in a while too. And then, uh, so, so, so we get this question, and my answer is like, okay, if you have one rod, right, just one rod, buy shooter. It is expensive. It's forty dollars for one hundred fifty yards, right? One hundred forty. Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's like forty bucks, you know. If you have one rod, yeah, that's the best. In my opinion, that is the best. And the 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 Tatsu? Use Tatsu? Mm -hmm. Tatsu's right CR there too. Tatsu. CR Tatsu. This thing is pretty good too. I've never actually used it, but people that have used both, they say it's pretty much almost the same. Uh, Tatsu is just, well, the, the sunlight's a little more stiff. But it's, it's, it's up to you. But for us, we, we, run, we run tournaments. So we need we need a good line that we can afford. Meaning we need what? A bunch of lines. We, need, we go through like 1,200 yards of line every three weeks on average, right? So you need you need to stock up on 10 pound, 12 pound, 16 and 20. So we got four spools of 1200. Yeah, 1200 yard lines. Yeah. And we spool them every every major tournament we would spool them every four. So you know that's that's stacking a lot of money. I mean, we have to spool so many rods. And it's not like we fish a 12 pound line all the time. So for example, if I'm on a crankbait setup Take that reel, I'm, I'll spool on 12 pound. But if I'm gonna take that reel and I'm gonna flip and punch now, pull that off, put braid on there. And, that, and once I pull it off, like from a tournament perspective, I don't wanna reuse that line. Like in my opinion, that line is used and now it's weak. And fluorocarbon is, is really bad at that. I don't, I don't know if, and if, you, if all the other guys are chime in on this and have a lot of fluorocarbon experience, I feel that fluorocarbon after five trips, it becomes brittle. Like mm -hmm. it becomes brittle. Has a lot yeah. of memory. Memory and from the uh, the sunlight just hitting it, it becomes brittle. So if you have twenty pound line, it now becomes like sixteen, and you're like, "Heck, man, this is stupid." You, know, I need to go fish braid all the time. Well, yeah, you do probably. Uh, so that's why I'm experimenting with a braid to floral leader now on, on the big side, like. Uh, like a 50 pound braid to like a 20, 25 pound floor leader. Uh, so, but yeah, to answer your question, uh, I've been, I, I had that same question too. Uh, when I first started fishing bass, uh, I, I, I experimented with me. I bought all all levels of sunlight. I bought the, the regular sunlight fluorocarbon that was only like 15 bucks for the 150 yards. I bought the sunlight uh, FC Sniper. We bought the, what was that reaction one, the purple mm -hmm. one? The reaction one discontinued. Discontinued. It's a good line. It's a, abrasion sucks on it, but for jerk baits, it's awesome. And then I bought the flipping FC. That thing, is, that line is crazy good, but it's super stiff. So super stiff. And then we bought, we played with uh, shooter, but it's so expensive. It's like I didn't want to talk about it. Only throw out yeah, day. yeah. Only tournament day type tournament stuff. Day it's like your Mega Bass One Ten. You only throw on tournament day, you know. Uh, and then I played with uh. Bass Pro Shops XPS. I've played with uh, a Braze X and an Invis X. I've played with Red Label. That stuff is garbage. Don't buy it. I mean, it's not bad. If you if, if your line never touches anything, Red Label is just fine. 
Okay. So the abrasion is so bad. Like I took a crankbait out and I was throwing it on my FC 10 pound sunline and I cranked like 20 casts and the sun, the line's still decent. You can see the cracks in the line, but it's still like you could catch a like a decent sized fish on it and you can still get in. And I, I threw that same setup on red label and three casts in, I grabbed my lure and I just pulled the line and snapped. Abrasion is not good on red label. It is the cheapest for a carbon you can get. Right? It's only like I think it's like ten bucks for hundred yards. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah it's cheap. cheap. Yeah, so if you're if you're if you're starting, if for the guys that are listening to this and starting, uh, an affordable, uh, I would say the best affordable is uh, is actually P line hundred percent pro carbon. You pay they have more stretch though. Yeah, it's more stretch, but you get more line too. Yeah, I think it's I think it's like seventeen dollars to get two hundred yards instead of one fifty at twenty dollars. So it's a good starter line to start with. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of recommended for a But top tier, we're 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 sunlight guys, you know. One and the little reason for that is uh for recovering, once you if you, if you throw it on a bait caster and you backlash it, it gets that kink in it, right? And that's the killer of floral carbon. Like that's the reason why I left all the other brands. When you get a kink in it and you pull it back, the FC sniper survives it. Like a lot better than the other brands. Like red level, if you get a kink, you pull it back, you just you just pull it, it just snaps. It's like it's really brutal. Yeah, it's real probably we can't bend it. Yeah, it's try not to bend it yeah. at, all, at all at all costs, basically. Uh mop strength is a lot better on the FC sniper too. That's one of the reasons why I just decided to just standardize on that. Been running it for what, three years. Yeah, FC sniper. Yeah. So the 20 pound has got us through a lot. And the 12 pound, I landed my personal mess on 12 so I have a lot of confidence on Yep. Uh, do striper gets conditioned like largemouth bass does? Um, not as much because they're running in a school. So they have that triggering effect of each other chasing or competing mm-hmm. for a bait. So they could get dumb and still um, still mm-hmm. buy your bait. While largemouth, they are conditioned to kind of like vibration and sound. So if you're key, if they're caught on that bait once or twice, they're kind of conditioned not to bite or not to react to that sound yes. on that bait. So over over a long period of time, the big large mouth they they yeah. seen everything, they it's know so everything, great. and they only want to eat either a really big bait or actual live bait. Yeah. And also the other thing is, if you look at the people that are fishing for these different types of fish, right? Bass fishermen, it is frowned upon to keep the bass. Which is stupid. They should actually keep all the little fish so the big fish can grow, right? But for the striper fishermen, majority of them, they harvest. So a fish can't learn to be conditioned if you eat the fish. You know what I mean? Right? Mm-hmm. Let me know if you guys agree with that. Um, okay, Lao Shaw, what is the best rated line for long distance casting? That's an easy one, man. We already said it. Power Pro Max Quattro, 20 pound in yellow. If you can get it too, that that's our best entire leader. Yeah, <laughs> entire fifty pound leader. You need to do a tour of all of your corn. You need to do a tour of all your horde fishing. Horde fishing. Yeah, we do. It's, it's yeah, kind of it's cool. still a mess. Having oh, once yeah. I set it up in my shop, then we'll we'll go over it. There's a bunch. Why dive over uh, all? Over other brands, um, we're not really strictly a Daiwa guy. Right. I have a, I run a Tranks on my uh, swim bait rod, mm-hmm. so I run a three hundred five gear ratio Tranks on my swim bait rod, yeah. and then uh, I do run a Shimano uh, Stella on my uh, yeah. shaky head rod. That's the crazy part, right? So we're big yeah. into Shimano too, but we're more on the spinning side yeah. than the the bait cast side. Yeah, so for the bait casters, we like Daiwas. I think Daiwas got that. That's my opinion. I mean, they make fifty dollar reels to like six hundred dollar reels. Yeah, that's I mean, ridiculous. And but, anything but on the spinning side, I think the Shimano's got it. It's, the Shimano has edged Daiwa out on the uh, the spinning world because I've always been a Shimano fan. You know, ever since I bought my first uh, Stratic. Oh man, for life. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we just don't throw strictly yeah. Daiwa. I mean, predominantly our our uh, Baycast game has been Daiwa, but right. I mean, I bought. You have three Stellas. Yeah, I got two Stellas. You got two. I got one. Yeah, one Stella. V. But, but my brother, uh, forty-seven, he runs two Sultanas. Oh, 
we're talking high end reels, right? High end reels. Uh, he's got two Sotegas. I have a, I have a cert. He's got two Sotegas, a Certe. I have a Certe, and I have a Stella. But I like my Stella better than my Certe. Yeah, like I have a 2004 uh, Stella, mm -hmm. and then I have a brand new, well, not brand new anymore, uh, uh, 2019 yeah. Stella, yeah. the FJ, I mean, or FO, whatever model. Yes, yeah. yeah, the FO model, the newest so, one. You know, we're not super bright loyal, so pick the best one that you want. Yeah. Okay. And especially when rods come to play, it's just all over the place when it comes to rods. Yeah. All over the place. Special technique per yeah. doors. Some companies build certain rods better, certain techniques better, too. On uh, those stripers in those, in like two feet of water, those big stripers are super smart, too, just like bass. I mean, they sing everything at them, too. And then those big strappers, they tend to maybe feed at night or they're only eating a certain bait. So they're more key in on the bait or you're just not hitting their, um, like not catching them at the window. Big strapper, we usually catch them at night. You don't catch big strapper during the day because they, yeah. I think they feed predominantly at night and strappers are more active at night than in the day too. That's why right when the sun rises, they usually feed and then, when, when the sun's up, they don't feed unless there's a good current running or something. But then they'll feed right before dark. And then if you can figure the night bite out, that's where you catch the biggest striper. The logo said it doesn't bite. The head was at least 10 pounds easy. I think it wasn't feeding on American Chef. Yeah. Daiwa SP middle would hit in these Oklahoma rivers. Yeah, we throw SP middles uh, on Sooner. I caught fish on SP middle on Sooner. Um, we threw them at even like bombers. It's almost like a, you know, just another jerk bait. We caught them at down in Keystone when the water's off. It's just, you just got to go out and try it. You, it sometimes. Try not to get stuck on rocks. Yeah, most of the time you're just. Thinking that bait's too big, but you're not throwing it. But they do, yeah. they do hit it. You just gotta spend enough time. Uh, one of the buddy James, he goes to your follow and throw that SP middle like five, six years ago, and and smash those strippers out there. So. Mm -hmm. Use a waffle popper or Berkeley Chapo. You know, I've never That's caught a Chapo, but I've got a, I've got like a ton of confidence in the waffle popper though. Like, I've I've done so well. I qualified for the national championship on a waffle popper. That's how much confidence I have on it. Uh, my Whopper Plumper, my favorite color is one of the original colors, man. Blue blood, chuck your line, smash it again. Small mouth strappers, just smash it. Uh, I heard good reviews on their Berkeley Chapel. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, you could get it at Walmart. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah Walmart is, yeah. Yeah, yeah so the, that's the only good thing about the Berkeley Chapel. Um, the thing about Whopper Plumper now is that their tails are not as hard as the original Whopper Plumper that came out. And the noise is less or something. It doesn't help as hard. Yeah, or something yeah. like that. But hey, if you're thinking that hard into it, you're probably yeah. Just this is the other thing about fishing too. Is don't make it too too hard because you're you're diving into like the little nitpicking type stuff anymore. And I don't think majority of the times, I mean, given certain situations, it does matter. But majority of the times, it doesn't matter. You know, if you're trying to pick between like a slight change in the pitch of the sound, it's more of one of those things where if you if you've been smashing them and you know the school's still there, the school's not catching them or not biting no more, then you change it up a little bit. Other than that, you know, it's just like, I don't know, throw a fluke. Yeah, you know? He's just not <laughs> around them. Yeah, he's not around them too. That's the other thing too. Because typically, strappers are very aggressive, right? Strappers, smallmouth especially, very aggressive. If they're in the area, they will show themselves. You know, it's not, you shouldn't have to work too hard for them. Uh, what's the average cost of out of town yak tournament trip? Oh, it's it's not bad. Yeah. Mainly it's just gas and food. Gas and food. Well, we don't we don't sleep there. That's what yeah, we don't sleep. wake up early and drive there. So your gas, your truck, or your vehicle mm -hmm. might be like fifty bucks, maybe forty bucks. Uh, to get yeah. there and back, yeah. maybe you know forty bucks. Yeah, you put a ride at forty dollars for gas, and then uh, food. Tournament tournament is only bucks. like fifty bucks. Tournaments just bucks. give it fifty bucks. So yeah. That's and your tolls. food is probably like 30 bucks. Paying tolls, maybe another $10. 30 tolls. for breakfast with energy drink, and then maybe 30, yeah. 30 at yep. fast food coming back. 
Ooh. So it's not that much. It's way better than pumping a boat a hundred <laughs> bucks and then yeah, see, that's the other thing too. But like boat tournaments versus kayak tournaments, right? Uh, a boat tournament, I can tell you right off the bat, you you got a you got a big truck, you got to fill up, you got a boat, you got to fill up, right? So you're probably doing like at least thirty gallons for those two. Thirty gallons are two dollars a piece. Sixty dollars. Sixty dollars. You're not even on the. You're not even on the water yet. Okay, so then you look at tournament fees and all those other. In a boat, I'm, I'm I'm estimating like you're well over 150 before you even start fishing. So that's why we haven't gone there. You know, eventually we will. Uh, yes, we are brothers. He's the oldest, 47, the middle brother, and I'm the youngest. Mm -hmm. Watching videos. Uh, well, five five nine. Keep doing what you guys are doing. Enjoy watching the videos. Thanks, man. Put a lot of effort into this channel. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, talking about shake What rod do you like? I prefer to stay around one fifty to two hundred. Is that dollars? <laughs> <laughs> that complete or just the rod? Oh, that's probably just the rod. Right? Um, yeah, he's all the rod. Uh, our rods are fairly cheap, actually. No, actually, my rod is pretty expensive. I bought a uh, expert rod, which is like two thirty, but I don't really like that expert rod as much as my TF4 rod that I just bought, mm -hmm. and it's only a hundred bucks. So really, one hundred and seventy, yeah. but eBay bidding. Yeah, bucks. we'll do a little video on that too, on the whole eBay bidding and how you can get good items for like half price. So, so I'm I'm on my shaky head rod. I'm not much of a shaky head guy, but if I do throw it, then I throw it on a. It's a seven foot IMX. It's a Lumens IMX. I bought it for 150 bucks. It's it retails for I think it's like 295 or something like that. But yeah, I actually I want it for like 150 bucks through eBay through a bid process. If you guys want to know more about that stuff, we'll do it in a whole video on that how to how to get like new items for like half price, you know? Yeah, and the reason why I, I was throwing that TFO rod is the sensitivity on it is way better. Yeah. Um that other rod, the expert rod that I had is a 7.6. It's a super long rod, but the sensitivity is not as good for some reason, and I can't feel the bite. So sometimes you either pick sensitivity over uh, the price, you know, because if you know that that rod is more sensitive, you will pay the extra price for that rod. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, shake your heads. Yeah, so the rods. <sighs> Do you guys go to the Sooner District? I tried there, but everything said be transferred. Yeah, the Sooner Lake for Mr. Burr Lockwood. Sooner Lake is private property. Okay, so let's just not even talk about going too far away from the marked path. We've talked to Game Warden before. He says as long as you stay on the marked path, you're okay. But you are on private property. The property belongs to the power plant. So they can give you a citation at any moment, okay? And you can't even argue about it, okay? So the, the the power plant gives you the permission, okay, to go walk the path to the discharge and fish it. Yeah. And, fish it. and that's all you can do. You can't go anywhere else. You can't touch the equipment there. You can't harass the animals that are there. You can't pick a rock up to throw it. You can't mess with the electrical equipment. You can't, you can't do it in the water. You can't use water. You can't, can't start fire. fire. You yeah. can't motorized vehicle yeah, right motorized vehicles. But then that lake, when it's, when it's on, it is on. Uh, Bay to leader. How long is your leader? I usually just want like a 10 foot leader on my Bay to leader on my spinning setup. Yeah, if you're doing like our smaller rod setups, I do about 10 foot. I just yeah. do this two of my <laughs> and then I just cut it in yeah. high. Um, when, it comes to, when it comes to surf rods, right? Because that's a very important one too. Surf rods, I try to keep it about five foot. About five foot meter on surf rod, but the surf rod it's like a 30, 20 or thirty pound braid to a fifty pound mono, big game mono. Yeah, yeah. Uh, braid to layer. Do you ever uh, let your connection not go through your guys, and when you throw? Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time, just don't let it go into your reel. Yeah. I usually have it in my guide somewhere, and when I throw it, it just comes out fine. Right. We tie the FG knot. FG knot. So uh, it comes through smooth. Yeah, it comes through smooth. So uh, the other knots, when it comes through, it could go. And the the trick is don't buy micro guides if you're planning to yeah. on your spinning micro setup. Guides. Don't buy micro guides or semi micro. Just buy regular guides because if you're doing that uh, micro guide setup, you gotta go straight for. You can't yeah, do my, I like breaking leader. Uh, let's see. 
biggest mm. sharper that we have caught. Um, 42 inches on freshwater, and then the one that are running up the river is about 40 inches. Mm -hmm. Probably about that 20, 23, 24, 25 pound class fish. Chris A says you want a really fast tip, right? Uh, kind of. Oh, depends, depends on what you do. Maybe it's depends like medium heavy. Have, like a medium yeah. heavy. Yeah. I, like for me, I like everything more stiff. So I throw everything more stiff because I like to pull the fish up. And I, th I believe that if the fish is hooked good, it's not going to come off. If the fish is hooked bad, no matter what you have, it's going to come off. So. And I like to boat flip my fish, even on spinning rod. I, most of the time when I throw a shaky head, it's like on, um, it's on a heavier line, like 10, not sometimes 10, mainly it's 12 and 14. I tend to throw it on 14 because our water is not super clear. So when I hook a fish, if it's under like three or four pounds, I'm boat flipping it. Yeah. And the other thing, I think, I think he's talking about rod action too. So I'll mention that a little bit. I don't want to get too in depth because that's a whole that's a whole session we get into too. But typically, if you're talking fast action, it's a it, it, it's it's the, the rod is faster to spring back to straight, right? So what I what I prefer is if I have to impart action to the lure, meaning you know top water, you have to so the lure can do this. Then I want a fast action, right? Now, if it's a lure that I'm just straight really, then I actually don't want a fast action. I want a slow action because because uh, you don't need it is what it boils down to. Especially with uh, lures with crankbaits, when with, lures with treble hooks, uh, that's at least that's what we've learned in the bass world. In the striper world, they don't seem to care, but in the in the bass world, uh, if you're reeling something and the bass has to come and get it, it's better to have a slow tip. So that way, you're still reeling it, and then the rod loads, which means it gives the, the bass enough time to open its mouth and suck in the more. Okay, so that that is important. That the differences between that is uh, a fish being hooked right on the lips, or the fish hooked inside the mouth. And you always want it inside the mouth every time you can get it. But the, the fast action is actually better on the surf world if you're gonna whip something really far out, because that's what the fast action is designed to do. When you when you power cast. You want that whip to come back quick, okay? So, so there's a pro and con of the, the tip action. Yeah, and the reason for the tip for me is because I don't like a limber rod because um, most of the time I'm throwing a single hook that is like a two knot or yeah. a one knot. So I want to drive that hook in, and if I go any lighter, then it's kind of like my drop shot rod that I keep losing fish on. It's super parabolic, but it's made for open. It's made for an open like hook drop shot. So if I do like a like a Texas rig, then I'm gonna lose that fish. Or if I throw a shake on it, I'm gonna lose that fish. Yeah. I mean I throw a swim bait like finesse quarter ounce heads on my drop shot rod and I still lose fish. So it just depends on your rod action to your hook. So if I'm on a two odd or something on my shaky head or size two hook, mm -hmm. I wanna drive that hook. And when I catch that fish. I know that fish is not going to straighten my hook because it's not in the rod that lets the fish straighten the hook. It's about your drag. So as soon as I hook my fish, I open my drag. And I'll, I'll fight the fish with my drag instead of letting the rod fight the fish. I open my drag looser than it needs to be. So if the fish just tugs, the drag is already spinning because, um, you know, if you have a good drag system like on a, on a Stella then, or a Stella, you know, it's it's gonna yeah. scream. So, and you can control it like every. I mean, it, it's really sensitive. yeah. Every really sensitive. Every little pull, it it will turn. So, and then I'll keep it loose. I'll just put my finger on the spool, pull up, reel my slack, and finger the spool again like this. Hold the spool down. Pull the fish up and reel my the slack in again. So it's cut. It comes from our surf surf reel uh, yeah. fishing too. Yeah. So the fish run just. Let it run, but if the fish stops running, then you want to hold the spool so it doesn't spin anymore, and you pull the pump the fish up. And you it uh, what kind of knots do you tie for the jig, hook, and crankbait? Uh, the knots to me is not dependent on the lure; it is dependent on the line you're using. Okay, so for me, um, if I'm using braid, I, I tie a uni knot, a double uni knot, right? For this guy, a uni knot. If it's braid, it's uni knot. If it's monofilament, it's uni knot. It doesn't matter if it's a jig, top water, swim bait, crankbait. That's what it is. Uh, but 
if it's fluorocarbon, then I tie an improved clinch knot. And the reason for that is I used to tie uni knots and Panama knots and all that stuff, but I would, and the knots would fail on fluorocarbon. So for me, I'd have, I'd have, I'd have like learn another knot just for that line. But now it's for our setups, it's 80% fluorocarbon. So uh, that's what I throw. I know you throw like, you improve. No, I just throw my, yeah. the, the uni knot I throw. Yeah. Most of the like pretty much. Yeah. The trick is when you throw on fluorocarbon, you just gotta wet your line so it doesn't burn your line when yeah. you cinch it down. Mm -hmm. So if you just wet it good and tie it good, I mean, if you tie one a knot consistent and it doesn't break on you, mm -hmm. you just go with it yeah. all the time. Yeah. So Dennis and Dan not producing any bit. Yeah, usually the dams, uh, if if you don't, you know, the dams, the success of a dam is directly related to how much water they're flowing out. So if you, if you look at past history and things like that, the best fishing years are always the years where the floodgates are on for like a month, right? And it's like astronomically high water levels. And all that stuff. So this year, I guess Texoma is not pulling too much water. Even our lakes are not pulling yeah. much water. So I think Arkansas has been running. Yeah, water. so that's why the striper dam fishing hasn't been very, very good. But if you're fishing Dennis and then hit the lake, if you have the lake, if you have a, a boat, that place is awesome. It's infested with stripes up there. Okay, so uh, what program do you guys use to edit your videos and who edits your videos? Um, I edit maybe 85% of the videos. Uh, and how you can tell if, is if uh, if it's edited by me or edited by 47 is if you look at a video, it's got all this cool, nice music and fade in, fade out, and all this other stuff. That's 47. 47 is really <laughs> good at it. Uh, he, he He's an art student. He used to do a lot of stuff. He had a bunch of art awards and stuff like that. So he's really good at it. He's really meticulous at it. He balances sound, audio, video, light, everything. If you just see, like, cut and paste all type stuff, then I'm more like that's me. Or me. <laughs> or this guy. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're, we're more anglers. We're not really uh, editors. Uh, 47 is a really good editor. But anyways, it's getting kind of late, guys. So uh, if, let's try to finish it up. Uh, we're going on two hours and 30 minutes here. So uh, get in your final questions. I know there's about 14 of you guys left. Uh, so if you're still watching and you have a question, let me know uh, here in the next couple of minutes. Otherwise, we'll be signing off. Uh, it's been pretty successful. Yeah. yeah. I thought we were just going to run for 30 minutes. I thought we were going to run for like 15 <laughs> minutes and then nobody's going to show up. <laughs> get for our, our take three. Our first <laughs> yeah, session. our take. So. Uh, we'll see what happens here. Um, I think we're out of questions right at the moment, so we'll see. But well, yeah, glad to have you guys on with us. Uh, it was, it's been fun answering all these questions, putting it on the spot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gotta get out some of those um juices and nuggets. So you guys, uh, a lot of good stuff that we just released, a lot of tournament like information too yeah it's kind of weird how we got bass and striper fans so we're back and forth back oh and yeah forth. let us know if you're a bass or a striper head because we need to know who you guys are uh what flavors you like and if you like everything or if we don't like any of it because i know we get a lot of subs from like the, the electronics world a lot of subs from the john moat world and then we really started with the striper world but now we're like doing kayaks and bass fishing too uh, yeah, we'll probably have to do a gear setup video. It, it probably comes soon. Well, not soon, but we'll 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 do one because his gear is totally different from my gear. So yeah. Yeah. people probably have one, and I probably have one. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the frog question from Chris A is: On a lake with a ton of shad, do you try to match that shad with a frog, or better going straight white or yellow? We got beam two the black works well bread brim bread yeah bread two brim two the black works well. um well the way i see a frog is if you're throwing white you're mainly imitating a shad and then if you throw yellow or a chartreuse then you're brim, imitating brim. a brim bluegill yeah. and then a black is just maybe anything on top like even a crayfish on top i mean i've seen red frogs before and that works yeah. so um <laughs> Yeah, if you're throwing a white, you're just imitating a shad. And I tend to go with this. If the sun's out, I throw a black frog or a yellow frog more. And then if the sun's away, I throw a white. Like if there's cloudy days, I throw more white. So it's kind of like that 
visibility matters a lot. So I throw white on all your days. Uh, Master Logdown says, do you guys do any catfish? Uh, we don't really do serious catfish fishing. Um, the only time we do that is when my uncle Razor calls and he wants to go Damn. drink beer and eat chicken fried steak type stuff at the river. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we will probably do a uh, we want to do a jug line video. I do want to do a jug line video. Yeah, I want to do, do I want to do a uh, frog gigging video too. Yeah, think about that. That's pretty redneck though. Yeah. <laughs> my dad actually wants to do it. So we we'll do my dad on that. What do we do? Possibly a couple of uh, how uh, I, I I work on cars. I do collision work um, from eight in the morning till five. Fish after work. That's why our channel is out of work outdoors. Yeah. Uh, on the weekends, that's work. when we get to fish the most. We don't fish as much as we used to anymore. We used to fish three to five days a week. Now we do one two. to two. Yeah, one, yeah. Two. one two. We've cut it back quite a bit. Uh, a lot of it due to COVID. A lot of due to him moving and getting all this stuff situated. You know. So a lot of that, uh, we have family that moved into town, we had to help them organize some stuff. And the wifey uh, times. Wifey times, things like that. And primarily because of COVID, you know, you kind of want to stay away from everybody for the most part until shit settles down. Uh, what do you do? What do I do for a living? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an electronics engineer. Let's put it that way, electronics engineer, and you're a... Uh, body tech. Body tech. Yeah. Yeah, she actually makes more money than me. <laughs> um, we don't have a lot of time to fish. We just make time to go fish. Because, like I said, like uh, I mean, some people they go bowling, right? And we fish. Some people go ice skating. Right? We, we fish. You know, we, some people like to do you know cool walks in the park. But we fish. We uh, are <laughs> hopping. We, uh, yeah, so bob bar hopping. We pot hop. You know, it's, 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 that's what it is. <laughs> uh, uh, Chris A says, uh, yeah, we do. I do mostly bass fishing. I like to get the drivers. Man, if you're coming from that direction, you'll never go back to bass. I guarantee you. Once you get on the striper train, there is no other fish that pulls like a striper. Yeah, there's no but strippers are simple. Once you figure them out, they yeah. get born pretty fast, too. Yeah, like a large mouth or a bass yeah. or a small mouth. I mean, every every given day you go out is probably gonna be different. It could be very yeah. predictable. It could be very yeah. predictable. Be Strippers good. are really predictable. So. Okay, David Chase from Fresno. Hey, Fresno guy. Oh, David Chase. We're, we're from Fresno too, originally. Yeah. yeah. Fresno moved up to Massachusetts and we don't know. Uh, Strippers all day, bro. Now, Sean. Yeah. That was me like a couple years back. <laughs> Strippers all day. Top one all the time. Uh, my Alejandro says my goal for the summer is to catch my first striper at Keystone Dam. Man, I never got one. Uh, laugh my ass off. You guys go cast and pull one, pull one all the time. It makes the scene so easy. Yeah, so so Keystone, we fished it quite a bit. We, we've, been, we've been fishing for a while. But the first, the first two years I would fish Keystone, I never caught a striper. Yeah, it, it was tough one. until you actually find Okay, it. so unless you figure out that little niche, what they like to do. Okay, so I'll give you, Alejandro, I'll give you a nugget, right? Just for you. Wait till the hottest summer day. Hottest summer day, right? Wait till the hottest. I'm talking 106 degrees out, right? Wait till the water's generating, right? And then wait till the water shuts off. Okay, and you have to give it some time. Don't go in the water yet, but wait till the water shuts off. Wait until you see the stripers busting the shad. There's going to be a moment between July and August when this is going to happen, right? Go out there, throw your favorite top water lure where it's busting. And when the water shuts off and then in the, towards the back, there are all these pools that kind of form when the water goes out and goes away, right? All these pools that are formed. And there's like 100 stripers out there. And you, you cannot go wrong. You, you won't catch your first stripper. Guaranteed. Nope. That's how we started. That's how we started. <laughs> yeah, we still have that video too. Somewhere. <laughs> it's on the YouTube channel somewhere. We don't do it much. We, we don't do it much anymore. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, there's not too many here, but there's a few yet. Yeah, we catch strippers at the dam all the time. I mean, if 
tribes trappers by nature, I think they they want to run up river. So when the water is running, they won't come up. So that's why dam fishing is so good, and that's why some people never leave the dams and they fish all the time in the dams uh, because it gets restocked all the time. Basically, you know, a lake can't get restocked. And and fish so has yeah. more places to run. Yeah. <laughs> well, if the dam is like you're stuck in a hundred yard stretch and he's not going to go anywhere, you know, so you could probably just go there every day and catch him. Well, anyways, uh, what time of day can you just for stripers? For stripers, you look in prime time. So if you're if you've been part of the uh, channel for a while, you understand prime time is golden hour for photography guys. It is in the morning. It's like five to seven. That's prime time. Sunrise and sunset. Yeah, sunrise and sunset. Yeah. Five and seven. Best time to catch your biggest fish too. Uh, Billy, Billy Yang. Oh, when fishing, when bass fishing, do you prefer to fish deep or shallow? Uh, if you fish shallow, you fish with a lot more guys. Yeah. But if you fish deep, then it's probably just you. So you just gotta find deep fish. But um, I pref fish. if I could find deep fish, I prefer the deep. I think it's uh, I think they, they don't get spooked as easy, and you can mess up a little bit, but you can still recover from it. But the thing about the deep fish is, it's like it's literally a needle in a haystack. You have to go find them. Whereas if you're fishing shallow, you can catch a couple. It wastes a lot of time too. Like you're throwing a lure out there in like maybe thirty foot of water. Right. You have to trust and your then electronics. It, it has to go down thirty seconds or ten seconds or whatever, and then you gotta retrieve it slow because you retrieve too fast is not off now off the bottom. So you got to retrieve it slow, and then when it gets back, you bomb the cast out. So it, a cast might take up to like five minutes. So. Cool, cool. I think, uh, I think we might just end it there. Any last questions for us? Uh, otherwise, we're going to sign off. We're, we're, we're topping two hours and 36, two hours, 36 <laughs> minutes. And I think we've let a lot of good, a lot of good information on this one. And this one was just kind of like a first in, intro kind of. Uh, we didn't really have a specific topic to talk about, but on the next one we'll have more like specific topics. And maybe we'll do one just striper nights yeah, for all the striper fans, nights. and then one just strictly bass fans. You know, yeah, we might do one on kayak preparations, and we'll do maybe one on boats, and we might do one on like uh, fishing line because that was a hot hot topic for a while there too. So yeah, well, so if you guys uh if you guys have something that you're curious about, you guys want us to actually do a like, whole dedicated video on. Then uh, basically jump on our Facebook page uh, and just post it from there. You know, if we get enough traction on it, we'll have a dedicated video, like two hours, thirty minutes to it. You know, so there's a lot of things I know people want to talk about, like how to find stripers, how to find bass. You know, uh, for the bass community, you might be like tournament winning tactics, and lots of more modifications. And for Jerry, I mean, if you're in town and you want to go cast striper and we're free, we'll be like, hey, just go meet us here and. That's where it might be hitting or where it is biting. And then we're like, well, we just see you guys up there. So, yeah. We don't guide, but um, we, we could just meet fans at places and fish with them too. So. There's a lot of hot areas right now. I know uh, Hudson Dam. Hudson Dam, lower water. I think somebody mentioned the water too. It's, it's biting real good right now. It's not stripers. It's hybrids, which is like some mini version of the striper. Uh, but they pull just as good. They just don't get that big. I think the biggest one I've ever seen is like 29. Uh, stripers and break the 40 inch mark, but there's a lot of them. Let's go out there and smash them. They hit top water, glutes, keep it simple. And we'll look at it. But those are probably the two hottest spots right now. Like I've been giving, uh, I've been getting feedback, I mean, within the last day. So go out there if you're in town. Uh, Lao Xiong said, You are fishing at the dam and you catching striper. What is your favorite lord to use? Uh, the one they're biting. <laughs> the one they're biting. No, but mainly is just throw uh, some sort of top water bait because you see the blow up. Yeah. See the blow up. It's fun. I mean, I even throw a rigs at Blitzing Striper and see that. Yeah. If, if, I had <laughs> pick, if I had to pick a favorite bait, and then you get into the world of your force feeding fish, which is not a good thing because uh, uh, you're, 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 for me, it's top water. Okay? So throw a big top water, Striper smashes it. It's the best thing in the world. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, you have to understand that if they're if he's gonna bite, if one fish is gonna bite that top water, there's five other fishes that will bite a fluke of some kind, something that goes under the water, you know. So if you're fishing for the table, I would say fluke first, 
catch four and then switch over top water and eat your <laughs> If you're just fishing for fun, then just top water on it. Yeah, don't force feed it. <laughs> yeah, that's something we had to learn too in the tournament. Don't force feed the fish. Uh, a lot of times the fish will tell you what they want that day. And don't get me wrong, it, there is a top water season, there's a fluke season, there's a swim bait season. But we've also seen during uh, top water season where they're, they, they are smashing the shad. And you can see like five or six shad jumping out of the water, but they will not touch the top water. Yeah, yeah. they will not touch it. Throw a swim, boom, get hit. Throw a swim, bait, boom, get hit. Throw a rattle trap, boom, get hit. Throw a chow bait, boom, get hit. You know, so. So uh, if you want to be a better fisherman, you have to realize that real quick. Like if they're blowing up on shad, you got two casts. I'm talking good casts. Like casts are really like, I gotta get bit. And you don't get bit, put it down. Switch to something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's how you become a good fisherman. That's how you got like freaking four about to get four AOIs, you know. It's like <laughs> he's good at that stuff. All right, guys. Uh what's up? All right, so I think that's about it, man. I think uh, I think that's enough for tonight. Um, I hope you guys are all subs. If you guys are, and uh, please share the stuff with your friends because there's so many nuggets here. Uh, but um, I think uh, we'll try to do another Thanks, one Christine. next week, and uh, we'll try to. I think is stripers are pretty hot, so we're, I guess we're gonna stay on the striper topic. I'll uh, probably go into more like surf rod setups because. They call it surf rod, but it's really a long distance casting rod, you know. So we'll cover more of that. I'll, I'll, I'll probably bring in some equipment to show you guys uh, everything from like beginner stuff to like expansive exotics. I mean, we got so many stuff to use right now. Uh, so I'll cover that. Maybe that one on the, on the next one. All right, guys. See you guys. See you guys. Later, guys. Thanks.